All right. Welcome one. Welcome all. We are here for another fresh edition of your favorite show of the week. Well, hopefully it is. You're joined here by the one and only Ronnie Collier Jr., my co-host. And today we've got a special guest joining us this time around, and that is uh, the one and only TJ Dimzer, who is uh, coming back from some wild adventures in the world of worlds. Worlds 2022 this year, um, which from the, the pictures and video, looked like it was a, a hell of a time. It was absolutely wild. Like, I think there are a handful of occasions I've felt like <clears throat> an esports event like the electricity in the in the arena overpowered feelings I felt at an actual like sporting event or even like a wrestling event, and this <laughs> yeah. was one of them. Like that arena, which is by the way, it was in Chase Center where the Golden State Warriors play, nice. and I was and like you can see from the pictures and and video we posted, that house was packed, yeah. like top to bottom, packed. Yeah, it looked like there definitely was uh, some energy in the building. And, uh, yeah, you know, having something this big going on stateside uh, seemed like it did not disappoint for those who were able to actually uh, show out. Um, and it seemed like they also had a, a, a killer opening uh, act, it seemed, as well. The opening ceremony um, had also some massive numbers and some uh, pretty popular performance, it seemed, with uh, both Jackson Wing and Lil Nas X getting involved. What do you think of the uh, of the opening ceremony? It was incredible. Although at the same time, like, I think I'm ready to not hear Star Walking for <laughs> uh, maybe a month. That song is very good, <laughs> but I think I heard it. I, I I must have heard that song just like every other minute of every day for the last <laughs> two weeks as I prepared my uh, coverage of this event. I mean, I suppose yeah. that's fair, you know. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Like that, Lil Nas X and Jackson Wang, they uh, they pulled out all the stops for this one. Like the, it was, it was like on the on the live stream, you saw it as like the digital event alongside the the uh, real the real dancing and performing. Um, mm. And on my video, you can actually see like where it was, where like the actual performance. And then the screen right above it showing the digital performance that people could see. I think that's a cool juxtaposition. Like they they had a really cool set of visuals and, and, and digital effects going on for this whole thing. Yeah, only yeah. the best really. Um I could tell they really went above and, and beyond and I'm so glad that you had a great time with like the entire production. Because honestly, you know, I think us as Shaq News, we go to a lot of events and there is times where at least I, I, maybe I'll speak for myself. Sometimes events just start to feel like the same old, same old, the rinse and repeat. But when I was watching some of this at home in between what I was doing, I'm like, dude, if I'm having a good time with this, I know TJ's having a fucking blast. I was not prepared for Jackson Wang, and the internet informed me <laughs> immediately <laughs> after I posted about him that I had been missing out. This guy is incredibly talented, and uh, I see it now. Like, it's, uh, I can see why people are so hyped for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely had an impact on on the uh, social media side of things with uh, some of our coverage and the website as well. So for the Jackson Wang fans out there, hopefully, uh, you know TJ here he brought you some of that content. Uh, we'll get, I, uh, become a new I fan for you guys. Saw, uh, <laughs> I hope y'all saw from the press conference that uh, that I hope you, if you follow Shaq News on Twitter. I hope y'all saw that question where uh, Jackson Wang was talking about Arcane and how he'd love to be part of a season two. Wow, that'd be in, that'd be interesting for sure. I mean, Arcane was huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt about that. And so, TJ, do you follow a lot of uh, League? I'd imagine. I've been off and on with League for many years. That game is very, very hard to play. Uh, it's got an unforgiving community. Um, and uh, I would say that the esports scene is very fun to follow. The the teams are very fun to follow. The the comp the competitive side is very fun to follow. It's just a very difficult game to play and stick with, um, mm-hmm. especially if you're playing solo. It's it's a it's a very difficult game to rise through because you you it's like any team game. You have to rely on on other players being good and civil. <laughs> 
Um, and that's not always the case. Uh, I know uh, I myself prefer fighting games because then in that case, the only one who's uh, who it falls down to is me. But, uh, but you know, like League of Legends is still a pretty amazing game. You, you've got teams that are just like working out the math on perfect synergies between champions all the time. And uh, they come, and it comes down to worlds where like they put the best of the best on the line. Yeah, that's a, that's a very yeah. good point. Um, and you know, we should, we should slide into it since it was indeed the best of the best. Um, what do you think of the actual actual showdown uh, going down there, especially hitting in the you know grand finals and such? Um, I, I could kind of tell that there was a, a ton of energy in the in the stadium, but. Uh, where were you leaning towards uh, as far as uh, you know the opening of uh, grand finals action and such? Do you think there was a favorite, or uh, did it kind of bounce out more as we uh, got past game one and two? T one was always a favorite coming into this because T one has won. I'm sorry, a little bit of a burp. Uh, T one has been uh, has won three prior world's championship finals. Mm-hmm. They uh, and and they've done it with t- two of the players that are playing for T1 right now have taken the team to those championships. Faker is considered the Michael Jordan of League of Legends, and I say that like yep. without any hesitation. That guy is insanely good at the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a lot of people that thought this was gonna and and uh, their coach uh, Benji or Bengi. Uh, he used to be their jungler, and now he's their coach. If they had won, this uh, Bengi would have been the first player in League of Legends history to win Worlds both as a player and as a coach. Um, wow, the so, history there, yeah, yeah. So there was uh, there was a lot on the line. They were trying to collect their fourth, but this was DRX's Cinderella story. DRX what, is another uh, South Korean team. They uh they have they've had players that have seen world's competition have made it to the end. Um, I do believe that it's that Barrel their support has been to three uh, world's championships on different teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and but like despite that, these people these folks together, uh, forming DRX, are the first squad to ever make it to the world's finals from play in like they weren't seated. They weren't invited. They played into the tournament and they were the first team to ever make it to worlds. And they're the first team to ever win worlds from the play in. That's, Im- that's, that's pretty difficult to do. Yeah. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm actually looking at the previous schedule, like the, the schedule from before shows that, you know, some of these teams kind of went through the ringer. Um, of course, you know, T1 doing really well in finals, they beat JD Gaming in semis, and they beat Team G in quarters. But uh, it, it looks like at the World's Main Event Day 5, oh, no, they actually won that as well, too. So they actually haven't had a loss since the top of October. It looks like they lost to Team Fnatic, which, I mean, honestly, with given their record, I'm on just their website right now, and everything that they win is in green, and then, like, everything they lo- lose is in red. There's quite a bit more green than red on this side. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a it was an extremely amazing run for them, and one of the things that that uh, Bengi on T one pointed out in the press conference is that DRX is a squad that you don't assume that you've beaten ever, and uh, you we saw that in this series. They had t- like T one dominated DRX in game one and three, like just crushed them out. And then in game two and and four, DRX just popped back and 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 they not only like pulled off an amazing comeback in game two, but they absolutely crushed T1 in game four, and it led down to a game five like a final game where the two were neck and neck for f- like thirty minutes up until like a very pivotal uh, play at this at, at the Elder Dragon, which is mm-hmm. one of the very last uh, game objectives in the game. It gives a team like extreme offensive power, like extreme killing power. And, and like once elder, nothing was settled until elder dragon was finished. And that's when DRX had it. And so everybody was on the edge of their seat in that arena. Everybody, nobody knew who was going to win that game until the very last minutes. It was 
so tense, so amazing, so electric. And it was like heartbreaking. And at the same time, like even the winners were like, like we saw Deft when he gave his speech, when he gave his speech after, uh, after the game winning, uh, in the, after the win, like that dude was ready to cry. He couldn't believe it. Yeah. seems like it was, uh, definitely an emotional moment, uh, for sure. And speaking of Deft, I know he, he, uh, was a topic of conversation this weekend as well, because, uh, it seems like he's had uh, quite the run of almost making it, but uh, not quite being able to pull out, pull it through, um, which uh, Low Esports had brought up originally themselves. So looking at the, the record here, 2014 semifinals, quarterfinals uh, from 2015 to 2020, 2021, and uh, finally landing that, that, champion, that championship here. Uh, so a big moment for him, it seems, as well. He and uh, Faker also went to the same high school. Like they, uh, they were, they've been rivals wow. for a very long time. Like they, it was a matter where Faker started playing a little bit before him, and Faker like made a name for himself. And Deft has never been a slouch, but he got he got started after Faker, and so this was a chance for him to prove himself against a sc- like not even just like a rival, but a schoolmate, and and show that he could stand alongside Faker, and he did it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think even yeah. deeper too. Like it, it, it goes to show that esports, as it is, especially over there, where they have a hard time proving its legitimacy because of like you know they can't play for money as easily, and there's a lot of other like stipulations and stuff attached to it. This shows kind of the world what gaming can do. Like I talk about this a lot on here, and I'm just going to reiterate myself that gaming is not really just a passion. I mean, some kids go to school for this. I mean, look at the storytelling between these two strong individuals, like between Daft and Faker, like. This proves that gaming is almost a lifestyle at this point. And if done properly, it can take you to new levels. Of course, you have to practice and, and be good, you know, and, and show a little bit of diligence. But, I mean, if done properly, you can be on the big stage like them. Like, that was just beautiful to see. Yeah, there are so many cool stories like that. Like, I think one of my favorites in all of esports is, like, Daigo left Daigo left Street Fighter for a while. And he went to uh, go play, uh, what was it, <laughs> Ma- Mahjong. A lot, mm. and, and in and in doing that, he met Bonchan and got Bonchan into Street Fighter, and they started training together. And then Bonchan won Evo in twenty nine, won Street Fighter Evo in twenty nineteen. Yeah, Bonchan, mm. you know, being <laughs> being quite the wild card at, at, at certain times. And I'm a, I had a couple of friends that used to always be heavy on some of his uh, his character choices and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to see people be able to inspire others to get involved. Um, in you know a particular game or just in the scene, uh, and that tells you, that shows you some passion in general about kind of how uh, you know folks can be in, infectious with that kind of uh, you know passion and commitment to any game. Yeah, and this was a big year for Worlds too because this is the first time in about three years that uh, Worlds has come back to a physical competition. Uh, mm-hmm. They've been doing it digital for the last couple of years because of the pandemic. So this is the first time, alongside a lot of other competitions we've seen this year, where it came back to a phys- like a fully physical format with a crowd. Um, they had sort of a physical uh, uh, last year, but like uh, sort of like they got the players together and then the the they just played in an empty in an empty stadium and uh, streamed the whole thing. So this was like the first year of Worlds coming back in full fashion. And uh, what a year it was. Like that, I don't think anyone could have possibly asked for a more competitive and more tightly, like, like they played down to the very last minutes. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it, nobody crushed anyone out. Nobody like went 3-0. It, it, was, it was down to the wire to the very last game. And I think that's probably some of the most amazing stuff you can ask for as a spectator out of a, out of a finals matchup. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think they, they also made it really easy for people to understand as well. I think, you know, the, to the level and the scale that League of Legends has done, you know, when you rent out something like the Madison Square Garden or, or pretty much anything that they rent out when they show up, um, it almost implies that, yes, the competitive community knows about this. We're selling this as a as a big spectacle. There's a performance here. Like anybody who's into any of the things that we're doing, regardless if it's just the gaming or the music or both, there's something for you here. And uh, you know, between how large they did it, 
between the storytelling behind it too, like you know, sh- hi- highlighting and showcasing you know these two young men and their journey, you know, through um, the entirety of the season, and then of course, like you said, like it going down to the absolute final minutes, like I'm hard pressed to see anything competitive like that can even go toe to toe with that here as of late. Like I mean, Halo's been doing great, fighting game community's been doing great, but man, like. League of Legends just revitalized what the term esports really meant over the weekend. Hmm. And it was a fun occasion too. Like I posted a lot of stuff from from the day before. They had a uh, a League of Legends fan fest out there, which it was pretty decent. I think I would that was one of the few places I'd like to see the the entirety of Worlds improve. And I think uh, Riot Games is in a very interesting place to do it. My issues with the fan fest were that, uh, like, it was it was cool. It was like a carnival. There was a lot of corporations and 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 groups out there repping like their stuff and, and uh, doing giveaways and stuff. And there were some uh, some fan events and meet and greets and all that. But like, I think that Riot Games could actually learn from Evo a little bit because League of Legends has a huge community of like cosplayers and artists and creatives, and they didn't have an artist alley. And I think to myself, like, why on earth would you have a fan fest that doesn't give the creators and creatives in your scene a chance to show their stuff and sell their stuff? Yeah, so that's uh, <laughs> definitely surprising considering how how uh, passionate that group is, too. Mm-hmm. The amount of, like, fan art and the uh, cosplay and everything else I see from League, uh, just in general, across media. Uh, you could easily have made that happen. You know, a cosplay competition... Uh, a couple other, especially for a fan fest situation. I mean, I feel like that's that's what I would think of first when you, it comes to that kind of layout. And Riot Games is in an interesting position where, like, League of Legends isn't the only game they have anymore. They have Legends of Runeterra, the card game, which is still in activity. <laughs> uh, they're going to have a console mobile version in Wild Rift, uh, mm-hmm. Which is the which is the console mobile version of the actual League of Legends game, and then on a not on a long enough timeline, they're going to have Project L, which is the fighting game that they've got in development. I think that's right. I like. I can understand if League of Le- if Riot Games kind of wants to let Worlds live on its own and be its own thing, but I also think that they have the potential to do something like a Riot Fest where they have competitions for Runeterra, Project L, Wild Rift, and League of Legends itself in one big competition. Whoa, 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 whoa. Calm, 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 calm down, TJ, all right? All right, you're giving away all this info for free, all right? <laughs> I need, need, need to be paying you for this kind of this kind of insight, all right? Because clearly you're onto something. I mean, I think you got a good point. They're, they're just, this is definitely an opportunity for them to blow this out of the water, especially if, you know, some of the new partnerships going on. You know, uh, stuff going on with Xbox, the same way that Sony moved in on the Evo side. You know, there, there could be a lot of money in there to, to kind of make something like this happen. Especially since, mm-hmm. you know, despite there being, you know, the different, uh, you know, uh, points throughout the uh, season, uh, the FGC side, there's still, there's been a lot of movement going on as far as uh, tournaments and stuff like that goes. Some of the majors aren't going to be available anymore. Some are started setting up shop. Um, throughout the year, so this would be a good opportunity for maybe Riot to kind of swoop in in there, uh, provide a kind of pick me up, and uh, a spot for, uh, between those evos and you know your your Capcom cups and such, in a way that could have a big impact. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad you brought that up too because like I I've, I've always thought that the tournament experience and like the con experience need to kind of merge a little bit easier. And there's some events that actually do, or maybe not con, but just more like fan related you know uh events you know figure out a way to like slam both together because like in my time in like competitive gaming there are like very competitive events and like the fan portion of it or like the cosplay portion of the vendor area is just like super whack and then if i go to something that's more like con or fan related then the tournament area is like not so good but i see events like blizzcon and what they're doing and i'm like right could do this too like right uh, basically a riot disney world for what three and a half four days like who wouldn't want to go to that BlizzCon is exactly what I was thinking about. Like they are rising to that level where they have that potential of they have the they have the spread of games, they have the community, they have mm-hmm. the they have the world stage to or they have the world notoriety to be able to put that on. And I think we're coming mm-hmm. to that part where like once Project L is out there, Riot Fest makes so much sense. 
Yeah, especially with this, you know, Netflix tie-ins, and you know, you can have some of the cast there from next season. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different things you can do there to bring in both numbers and get some buzz outside of just the gaming side. Um, that, that, that reach a bigger audience uh, than just folks that play the game. I mean, I have plenty of friends who have gone in the arcane who do not play League, um, just because they like the idea of the characters and such. So, I would like to see if they could expand on that with uh, maybe other projects down the line. And like right. more more than that, I, I fancy myself an okay league player. I wouldn't mind having like casual setups at a at league at a League of Legends fan fest. Like oh, imagine the trash play talk against other players. If you like <laughs> meet me outside on the absolutely on the, the, the casual absolutely. cabs, you know it's gonna <laughs> get a little spicy. All right, well, yeah. since, well since you since we have you here, TJ, I'm gonna improv a little bit because we were gonna talk about Project L. There was some 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 leaked information going on. Uh, spreading around about the overall roster or cast. Uh, did you get an, did you get an opportunity to see any of what was supposedly coming out of, you know, some of that, that side of things at all? I need to see this link really quick. I, I got a glimpse of it, but I didn't. Okay, I'm looking at it now. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there, so some things were, were coming out over the weekend that people have been speculating on, on, you know, as far as the overall cast. We'll see if, you know, Riot in turn... We do something kind of like what Capcom did when the Street Fighter Six roster leaked or whatever, and just you know drop you a full impact of what's going on. But in the meantime, uh, if this is actually true, how do, what do you think about the the overall roster? Do you think it's, do you think it's looking like the kind of thing that's going to draw in? Of course, we don't know how these these characters play, but just based off of the people that you're seeing on that list. Um, there's uh, there's no Swain or Lilia. This list is trash. <laughs> um, <laughs> those are my two mains. But uh, looking at this right now, it's a good mix of like different styles and new and old characters. We've got folks from the we've got characters from the very beginning of uh, League of Legends, including Lux and Ezreal. We've got characters mm-hmm. that literally yeah. just came out in this last year, including uh, Samira and and Set. If this is the spread of characters that we have for Project L, and also like there's a good spread of like zoner style, uh, long distance between Ezreal, Jinx, uh, close up brawler style with Darius and Elo- and Eloy, uh, and Riven and Rengar. Uh, you have actually with Rengar, you have like that guy uses stealth a lot, and so you have sort of, I would say sort of you could have sort of a reptile fighting style from MKX. Uh, ah. Um yeah. and then you've got characters that are healers, characters that are zoners and uh like Th- Thresh would make a great zoner. That's a great pick for like a zoning type character cuz he uses that hook that he's got with him to yank characters inwards toward it, towards him. Um so like for what I see here if this list is accurate, this would make for a very fun spread of like brawlers, tanks, mages, zoners, rushdown, uh, set play. I mean, I see Timo here, the little little hamster. <laughs> that that dude, that's the dude that drops mushrooms on the map and they turn invisible. And so, if you don't know where they are and you run into them, you take a ton of damage. And that would make for a good set play character in a fighting game. Yeah, that's true. I mean... Um, this is exciting. This is exciting to see. And, like, there's so many characters in League of Legends. There are so many characters. That part, yeah. There, is, there are tons of characters, especially the idea of them having seasons or DLC and such. Uh, it seems like they're really taking their time with uh, the game overall, especially with the idea of uh, both concept and eventually balance, I think, uh, from what we've seen in the past with some of those conversations being had. So, yeah, you know, but... It's not like they're really taking this seriously as being like their step into the world of the FGC and trying to get the uh, you know a lot of those kind of folks uh, to kind of catch on early on. And right? it's worth noting once again that uh, Tom Can- Tom Cannon right is yeah. former Evo lead is is like one of the directors on this project. That guy knows his way around a fighting game or two. He's not gonna and like I like that they've taken their times with their time with this there's absolutely no reason to rush this out i mean especially with especially with like street fighter 6 coming out next year possibility of tekken 8 like there's no reason to try to get in a fight with street fighter 6 please don't yeah that is not the right way to go right now in my (laughs) opinion 
Um, and we still don't even know what another one was up to, you You know, uh, which I, I imagine the announcement's probably going to be coming soon on that end. So this, this could be a massive year for fighting games and, uh, you know, even more reason for there to be potential for maybe Riot to get involved in putting together their own event. In similar ways, maybe having some kind of a partnership startup as well, outside of just the overall um, game style, like you mentioned. But that fan fest and those kind of things, expanding onward uh, into the next year, I think is a really smart idea. Uh, on top of, you know, I hope that even if this game is, is a bit far off, uh, I would like to see there being some kind of movement for getting some of the FTC involved, some of the known names and such. Uh, if there ends up being like a beta or something like that down the line or, you know, some conversation about the developer and how players are going to, you know, how fighters are going to play and mechanics and such. Those are the things that people are interested in, especially when it comes to a, a brand new fighter that doesn't have a kind of history that you can kind of lean on um, or examples. I would like to see some of that kind of in-depth kind of communication with the audience and community overall at some point down the line in a way that we can actually have something to grab onto besides just characters if it's someone like me who doesn't play league um tell me more about the mechanics and such you know let me know how to, how this gonna, how this is going to be different than some of the other games out there one of the things that riot games has done an excellent job with when it comes to uh league of legends and new characters is the champion spotlights which are like full-on showcases that drop like the what the character's style is where they're what lane that they're best played in and then we get like a rundown of each and every one of their abilities in action and demonstrated. And then we get to see, and then sometimes they go into details like what characters these characters synergize with or what items that would be best to build on to them. Yeah. And I think that that's something that they should apply to Project L. Like if there are a lot of fighting game fans out there that don't know anything about League of Legends, you should, I think that they should bring the champion spotlight style to these characters when it comes to Project L. Yeah, that sounds like it would be pretty smart. I mean, you see how much viewership and such that those kind of things get on, you know, even when it comes to like Overwatch or Apex, you know, the new character drops um, and the same kind of like reveals for characters in the Street Fighter and those kind of things. But I think really breaking down how um, maybe some of the history and lore behind some of the characters as well. This is going to be something brand new for a lot of us who are coming into it. We may not know some of that uh, that backstory, and and you'd be surprised how much people get into the uh, the lore and behind the scenes stuff for you know characters or if they're related to other characters. Those kind of tie ins might have an impact on people uh, beyond just the way they play. Uh, I mean, it expands a lot when it comes to both the fighting game side, but yeah, just figure that you know. Get a little, little conversation going there on that and about, you know, some of the Project L stuff since we did have uh, a bit of some some breaking info on that side. Uh, we'll see if, you know, everything ends up being legit as far as overall, you know, leaks and stuff go. But even um, in this situation, I think people just are, are thirsty for some kind of info about the game. Uh, yeah. It's been a while since we got any kind of, like, you know, conversation or sit down with devs or, you know, even when it was early in prototype stage or just a little bit that they showed us. Um, I think that coming out of outside of Worlds right now, it could be a, a pretty big deal if they drop some more info, anything pretty much before this year is over uh, about that side of things. Yeah, it'll definitely be super interesting to see because, like, you're right. We haven't. I I can't remember the last time we saw an official address of uh, of the game. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's been, been quite minute. a. It's been quite a bit. I uh, I am very still excited for it. It's it's I think it's going to be a blast when it comes out, but uh, I re I very much and I know a lot of other people do too. Like I'm very much interested to see like what its basic mechanics are. Is yeah. it going to be just like a straight up heads up fighter, or is there going to be some sort of item build type thing where you like you can attach certain League yeah. of Legends shop gear to your character to give them certain buffs or something. Yeah, I'm curious, I, like, how they're approaching it to make it something that's going to be unique enough that it stands on its own outside just the characters themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what always is, at least for me, you know, because I like more of the technical end when it comes to fighters, uh, knowing what kind of mechanics you're going to put in game, like, you know, whether they be some kind of mixture of, you know, pairing mechanics down the line or, you know, those kind of, those kind of things. Uh, just to make it stand out a bit differently, the same way like when we when we first started to see stuff like Dragon Ball Fighters and stuff like that coming on down the pipeline, 
and they would slowly show off uh, some of the different mechanics being applied there and whether it be um, relatively friendly for new users and stuff like that. Um, seem to have a lot of conversation and stuff going. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, pretty much the last thing I had for you before, before I let you get out of here, you know, I did see that they that uh, the finals MVP was uh, was listed here for the uh, the world's event. Um, Shall I put up Kingen. on the screen here in a second? And uh, Kingen, you know, DRX top laner Kingen. Yeah, so like you know, what did you think of his performance? I mean, obviously he he got the got the the trophy there, but uh, you think it's well deserved? Kingen earned every bit of that MVP trophy in Game Five alone. Like he was playing oh, pretty dang hard in the top in the top lane. Uh, he plays a character called Aatrox, which is like a a a, a very well sustaining bruiser. Like the character has an activatable stance where once they're in the stance, they uh, they do more damage and can apply knockups to enemies. And then after they're out of that stance, they're kind of more vulnerable for a bit. Kingen did an incredible job of managing that stance and going in hard to the paint when, uh, when he had the momentum, he played so damn well in, uh, in, in game five that T one had to adjust specifically around him. And, mm -hmm. uh, and like that, that is that, that that's what earned him that MVP. He was an, a hugely impactful player throughout that series. But he was the 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 key. He was the key to their victory in Game Five. Yeah, sounds like he was definitely uh, the guy uh, leading into that last game, and it shows a little bit of bullying there. But it, it but it paid off, you know. Having to have those kind of uh, aggressive strategies to make things work sometimes is definitely uh, definitely necessary. But yeah, it seemed like there was a bunch of uh, a bit of a nail biter going into, like you mentioned, into Game Five. Uh, which is what you want to see. I think that, you know, when it comes to any kind of eSport, you need these kind of, uh, you know, championship matchups that end up being uh, both entertaining and uh, show really the best of the, of the sport. Um, and it seems like we got a mixture of all of that here uh, with this, uh, this year's Worlds. And a little Lil Nas X, you know, shimmy and shaken as well. Which is he, nice. put on a hell of, he put on a hell of a show, too. Like, I won't take anything away from Lil Nas X. That was a fun performance. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what we need more of, you know. I'm all I'm all here for like more of the entertainment side hitting the esports angles because ultimately a lot of folks I, I I think that you know we can all kind of talk on uh the mixture of like stereotypes that are tied to gamers in general, but you know, there's so much to, uh, crossover when it comes to both, you know, music, gaming, entertainment, TV, film, etc. that people are all into um that uh, I like to see more of those uh, crossovers happening uh, in different ways on the esports scene. Mm -hmm. And like we said before, Riot Games is in a very unique position where they can take advantage of like the gaming side, the the TV and t the TV and movie side, the uh, the the fan art enthusiasm side. There are a few companies that have so much going on in a in a in a variety of multimedia and uh and community engagement and i think that they would be silly to not take advantage of that over the next quarter over the course of the next few years man tj making a whole lot of sense here i mean i don't really have riot on speed dial but you know i feel like they should be listening in on some of that and making it happen especially you know when people are honestly a bit thirsty to get back out there to some of these events after we come out of a, you know, quite lengthy pandemic with a, without in-person events. And then having one uh, pull it off in this way, this could be a great time uh, leading the next year to kind of uh, do some things pretty big. Yep. Worlds 2023 is probably going to be even bigger, but Riot Games, if I don't see a independent body pillow booth at an artist alley <laughs> next year at fan fest you blew it <laughs> wow well yeah so huh. we, we want more of that action in there for sure you, you guys you guys make sure that you you show tj some love on socials and such and also you know check out some some of those videos that we put up on on the twitters and instagrams from this past weekend 
want to see some uh, some of that Jackson Wang action, some other uh, footage. I mean, uh, just the overall scale of the the crowd and the stadium and such was was pretty awesome to see. So uh, you know, thanks as usual for 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 pulling up, TJ, and, and enjoying us. And uh, hopefully, we have you on again sometime in the future. You know, and some more showdowns in Street Fighter Six. I hope they have another beta or something going on in the yeah, future. Yeah. Let's make it happen. All right. Well, until next time, y'all take care. Talk to me, sports. Bring that show. <laughs> Peace out. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're up. We got plenty more to talk about right. on the show. You know? That's facts. And yo, my bad, man. My my internet here in this in this hotel is just not good. And that's like the second time this has happened because the first time I was in Cuba and the internet wasn't really good there. And then in Puerto Rico, the internet was a little funky mm-hmm. in the hotel. So I'm struggling right now, but we're going to get through this now. I think for our next topic, Danny, is it, is it Brawlhalla time? Is that what we're jumping into? Yeah, it's time to get into some, some Brawlhalla, you know, which is obviously... They've had some ups and downs, uh, especially on the community side after some of the other uh, stories we've had in the past and, you know, some of the live stream action and those kind of things. But as far as the competitive and pro Brawlhalla goes, uh, you know, some good times uh, this past weekend. Uh, mm-hmm. And, yeah, it was quite the quite the showdown going down, some some big stuff for Brawlhalla fans out here. Um, but what did, what did you think of the overall event? I mean, we got, you know, World Championship, big deal. I don't remember how much was on the line as far as uh, money goes, but I can, I can probably find that as far as the actual They had about a, uh, a million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was, it was big. Let me, let me just double check that. Um, which I know was uh, also a big deal on that end. Uh, there was plenty, plenty of money on the line. So, I mean, while there is, you know, a bit of up and down when it comes to Brawlhalla being what it is, uh, sometimes from the community angle, um, there's definitely plenty of support for the uh, competitive side, it seems, with the with the game. Yeah. And they've also had some recent updates and uh, releases. Of, I know uh, they have, like, Alucard and uh, where mm-hmm. Belmont joined the game as well recently. So there's still brand new content coming out as well regularly for, for Brawlhalla. Uh, which is, is always good to see. You love to see uh, a scene still being supported and uh, supported yeah. long-term in different ways. Well, and, and that's just kind of what, what you want to see from a game of this stature. You know, we talk about, like, dev support, and especially a game like Brawlhalla that leans very heavily into, like, skins and, and DLC and costumes and stuff. Um, you know, I, I can't think of any other game besides, you know, the NetherRealm titles, you know, Injustice and Mortal Kombat with how they kind of go about the way they handle their DLC. Over here in the land of Brawlhalla, they just keep going and keep, you know, churning out hit mm-hmm. after hit. And honestly, I ain't mad at them. Now, I'm looking at the BCX uh, weekend schedule right here. And honestly, uh, it, it looks like they kind of have the work cut out for them. So things kind of kicked off a wave A at 10, a, uh, 10 a.m., excuse me. And uh, this, yeah, I think all the waves ran until about, yeah, ran until about 5 o'clock, which actually isn't bad. Like, I think that's a good run of show. Get these players in, get them out, you know, let them go break away. Once it's done, once it's time for them to stop playing, they can go eat, boom. Mm-hmm. And then it, they also did 1v1 phase 2. And that, of course, was the best of the best of the previous phase. And that ran from about 6 to 9 o'clock. So about, about you know, 3-ish hours. But I think, of course, what everybody wants to talk about is the finals. Now, with how that wrapped up, it looks like we had Impala versus Godly and Grams. Impala... A bit of a Cinderella story kind of came up through the Arcadians, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. and was able to, um, you know, kind of fight his way to the top, right tenth in the world right now, according to his Twitter bio. Now, when I went actually on uh, Liquipedia and stuff to look up the actual rankings, I didn't see him at ten, but as we know, Wikipedia and Liquipedia <laughs> are Liquipedia and Liquipedia. So anybody can shit. I can go in there and change myself into you know number ten. So said he's number ten. Went against Godly and Grands here, and this was actually a pretty fearsome set. Um, this is just what you want to see from an eSport. This is really what you want to see, especially from somebody like myself coming from the world of Smash. Um, this is just eSports done right. Um, and, of course, this isn't to say that what we might see in December from Smash won't look similar to this because we have two tour finals in two weeks. But for Hall, it kind of laying that foundation. Then, you know, Ubisoft throwing in all that money, I believe, throughout the entirety of the tour, a million dollars in prize pooling. I think about $500,000 for just finals here at BCX. Bro... Anybody out there that's a little hesitant or preemptive to play Brawl Hall, I'm going to tell you right now, this game could definitely change your life. The, the number 10th player in the world was able to run it all the way 
you know, the grand finals and win it convincingly too. And from winners, like didn't drop a set in grand. So he's looking pretty good. Yeah, I got I to gotta agree there. Uh, you know, having a bit of a Cinderella story coming in, uh, it looked like almost like six times the amount of uh, overall earnings or winnings um, from tour- tournament and championship play. Uh, pretty awesome to see. Um, like you mentioned, th- this is definitely uh, something that we want to see more of in any uh, esport, but uh a, a great story for for Bra Hall as well, uh, just overall with uh, showing that hey, you can work your way up by just being that good. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, as more characters get into the mix and such like that, uh, things always change. But it's good to see that there there's enough balance there that uh, you know your your competitive or top players can uh still have to be challenged by newcomers, um, which is what you want to see in any kind of fighting game uh, uh down the line and com- in competition. This way same way we mentioned in worlds, you know, about there being an underdog. Um those kind of uh, scenarios can also still occur in under games and make it really entertaining to watch. Yeah, and another thing too, I wish TJ was still here for this little tidbit as well. But one thing I like that they did was I'm on the Brawl Hall of East Twitter account. Twitter account, and they did a good job at highlighting the community as well. Um, of course, you know, this did cost money to pull up to like any other tournament, but, you know, they allow people to come in and cosplay to the cosplay contest, you know, I mean, it looked really, really good, and honestly, this is the type of stuff I'd like to see more from other fighting game tournaments. Now, I say that, of course, if they can do it within the realm of possibility, each tournament is ran differently, and this with this big championships, is a fixed bracket of only so many players. The average fighting game event has like thousands of players it's kind of hard to squeeze stuff like that in but it looks really really good and i think they even collab with spiff space as well so big shot to spiff as well you know just crossing genres over i mean they they did um they've done a tekken release before um i think that was a little bit more in-house this time actually partnering directly with brawlhalla for their uh their merch their attire this year and damn it does it look good as always so big shout out to the team down there use code bcx free uh for free shipping on their championship merch. Uh, it looks like it's only running from November 4th through 7th as well. So, Rahala really went all out. Um, I used to believe that they were kind of sectioned off from the rest of the fighting game community. If I go to Cobble Breaker, they're there kind of doing their own thing. You go to DreamHack, they're there doing their own thing. This one was the first championships where I really watched it and it felt like they wanted to make, a, make it a goal to expand. Not only just like community-wise and player-wise, but really what you can and can't do at the event. It didn't feel like you couldn't do anything. It felt like you could really pull up, get some cool merch, cosplay contests, all the different side events they did, and just really make this what a platform fighter championship event is supposed to be, just something for the people. Yeah, and I think that there is, you know, there's something to, <laughs> like you mentioned, like growing and expanding these things into more than just the game itself. And while there can be massive prize pools, like we mentioned there, you know, with the money being spent on the tournament end, there's got to be time and effort put into building both the community side, but also the tournament organizing side. Which is, you know, like I talked about in an interview with, uh, you know, Rick, you know, over at Comic Breaker and Evo back in uh, earlier in the year, he mentioned that, you know, if, as long as it doesn't interfere with, uh, you know, organizing the, the tournaments and the actual gameplay, He's willing to give it a chance or a shot to, you know, have an impact or uh, show up, uh, you know, at his events. And that takes a lot of effort <laughs> both on his end, but also on the organizers ends, you know, the volunteers and such. All that has to come to, come in together and work in tandem to make sure that things go off without a hitch. And especially when, you know, people are eventually spending money on this kind of stuff. You know, you have both your spectator badges and those kind of stuff that cost, but also like, you know, artist alley and the cost for a booth or something in that artist alley or those kind of things that kind of offset costs. And so all that kind of organizing, I mean, you, you need people to think ahead on those kind of things and also are able to make sure that they actually happen when it's time to on the day of. So it's not easy to pull off. It's definitely not an easy task. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, some of the, uh, some of these games are, are, are needing more of that kind of, a kind of organization and, and, and follow through because, you know, FGC, Street Fighter, Tekken, et cetera, 
they, you know, will have different events pulled off or, you know, different majors that have a mixture of everything. And you're having all of these communities getting involved, which also means that a lot of different people coming together and some of them volunteering to make some of the side stuff happen as well um, on a bigger scale. And it may not necessarily be available in the same way it is for Brawlhalla right now or some of these other games uh, without someone actually taking the lead and, and making it happen. So we'll have to hope and and see that, you know, there's more of that kind of community in and on that side. But there's definitely folks out there that want to show out, like, you know, like you mentioned on like the cosplayer scene and those <laughs> kind of things. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, despite some of the uh, earlier uh, community issues that we might have seen from uh, some of the, the Brahalla behind the scenes uh, side on the company end, uh, there's a lot of passionate people who may be in, ready to get involved in, in making more things happen. Uh, on a long-term scale for the game itself. Yeah, 100%. Now, on the topic of passion, Danny, <clears throat> I'm down here in the Dominican Republic for a wonderful event called Blink Respawn 2022. Now, this event, we talked about storylines with League of Legends Worlds just this last weekend, and this one has some really good ones intertwined into this event's DNA. The biggest two is that we ran Street Fighter V, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Now we talked about Street Fighter Five and the beauty of that community. <clears throat> you know, y'all got we yipes and everybody came out for this. The fact that the game is still doing numbers despite the announcement of the new title, people pirating the new title. You know, I know people don't want to talk about that, but that's definitely happening. People have access to it, and people are still showing up and going in. That is a beautiful thing to see, and I think Bleak Respawn gave us just that. Now. Um, of course, Punk came out. We had some some killers, but I think obviously the biggest one is Mena, this, which is this is you know, his home turf. And then we have Punk. Uh, Mono as well pulled up. Big shout out to him, of course, the organizer right there. The head honcho from First Attack in Puerto Rico came through and did some damage in top eight. But I think the biggest thing to talk about is Mena, of course, uh, defending his home turf. So Punk, of course, you know, bro, better than me. That punk is no slouch on the sticks, okay? Like, you, he can pick up most games and do pretty well. I think he got second in Street Fighter Five this weekend, and he plays pretty well in Dragon Ball Fighters. Him and Mena threw down, and I think it there were Luke Dittos, or Mirrors. I guess they call them Mirrors in the FGC. Luke Mirrors um, and Grands as well, man. I mean, I don't know if you had a chance to see any of it, but I got to tell you, bro, this was some of the best Street Fighter Five I've ever seen in my entire life. Well, I mean, I have to say that clearly Street Fighter Six is rubbing off on folks because mm. Luke has never been more popular <laughs> than like at a time where like I Luke was whack as hell for the longest, all right, as as being like a a character that's supposed to be carried into the next generation of Street Fighter and everyone's like Okay, it's just another blonde character to me. Mm -hmm. Add him to the list with the others. But after running through uh, Street Fighter Six, it seems like people are carrying some of that back into uh, the gameplay side when it comes to uh, Street Fighter Five, and we're seeing some of these. You know, for there to be a Luke Mirror match right now is uh, showing the impact of the future game for sure. But you know, Punk, like you mentioned, yeah, definitely not a, sl a slash at all. And uh, when I uh, you know, it's been going hard for quite some time. So, yeah, on his home turf, putting it down, very, very interesting. Uh, you know, I know that, that Punk also had some choice words in the past um, about uh, some of the other events like Combo Breaker and such or whether he's going to come through for those. But um, it seemed like he had no problem with pulling up for the Dominican Republic and putting on a show. You know what's funny is that... <clears throat> You know, he had the words about Combo Breaker, and we know the community starts with our players, so the players are on a bit longer of a leash than I think the commentators and the organizers and the bracket runners and stuff. You know, they we can't do these without them. You know, they represent the community at its most top professional level. And what, what was weird was, yeah, he did have the words for Rick and Combo Breaker, and I, I thought back to that, and I thought, of all the TOs, of all of them, Rick, bro, like, Rick is the one that will literally – take time out of his day to sit down with you and talk about life long before you talk anything gaming like you can really shoot the shit with him but I, it looks like you know obviously a, a switch in, in tune for punk this weekend i think the dominican republic scene makes it very apparent that um you know it's it's community first you know they treated us very well you know when i got here you know i know punk i think either pulled up thursday or friday yipes has been here for a while as well and um they really wanted to give us like the grand experience and i think they did just that and i i don't no punk very well, but I caught him smiling quite a bit this weekend, and a lot more than I've ever you know seen him smile in, in tournaments past. And so, because usually when I see him, he's just like you know in tournament mode, you know like who's my next opponent, who do I got to KO. But mm. he was in a very good mood this weekend, which is 
is amazing to see. Now, of course, we have Super Smash Bros. Ultimate as well. Another bracket, another tournament ran, and it filled the same exact void right there for the Dominican scene. Uh, the grand finals was Sonics, in my humble opinion, top five in the world. Of course, best Sonics, the best Sonic player to ever do it. Faced off against Capitan Sito, another sponsored player, very strong out here from the Dominican Republic, running Me Gunner. So on paper, when I tell people about this grand finals, their first thought is, oh, it's Sonics, kind of campy. You know, it's me, Gunner, projectile characters. It's going to be a lot of running and a lot of shooting. It really wasn't that. This was one of the scrappiest grand finals ever. I think personally, and I don't like to brag a lot about myself, Max and I gave some of the best commentary I've ever heard for Smash Ultimate. The audience was electrifying, too. I mean, Denny, you've been the combo breaker. This was basically like Dominican combo breaker. Like, the audience was like every stock loss, every time somebody won or lost over in Street Fighter, the crowd just erupted. I that's honestly what, that's couldn't. What, that's what I want to hear, you know. It's I'm crazy, glad, bro. I'm glad you had that kind of experience, you know. And, and you know, gotta give some love to, you know, the international scene. I know that obviously, there's always you know some big conversation about you know things that are run here stateside, but there's plenty of passion around the world, um, as you can see here. You got to experience it firsthand. Um, and there's there's plenty of things that bring bring us together, and one of those things is video games, but fighting games. Both the the art of competition, but just uh, you know, when it comes to the tech side of things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when Street Fighter Six drops, your tech comes and such, and people are just trying to figure out, you know, how to make these characters work. You see that coming from all over the planet. <laughs> like there will be people that, that discover things, you know, some obscure Twitter account will find out some kind of crazy loop, and they think you know everyone's trying to do it in the back. Um, so that is, this is a, an exciting time right now in general, but. Uh, Seems like, you know, folks were, were pretty hype about this one, too. Uh, they were, man. You know, I got to really give it to the rest of the, the scene as well, man. Um, of course, the event was put together by two very strong organizers, um, Nicole and Donald. So I'm not exactly sure if they're watching this, but if you are, you know, big shout out to you. Um, you kind of did the impossible in a lot of ways. You know, it's very hard to, you know, get players to come over here, to get players to show. Because as we know, Americans are just... They're like, why do we need a passport? Why do we need to go anywhere? Y'all need to come over here. Well, honestly, friends, take it from somebody who's been to just about every fighting game tournament, every dream hack, every one of those types of events. This event looked better than like 70% of the fighting game tournaments I've been to. I'm talking fighting games and Smash, okay? Ooh. This but this looked like dream hack, bro. I wish I wish I took more pictures of the stage. Like, Denny, if you and I would have been playing in Grams, it would have been like you, like striking a pose with your character behind you, me on the opposite side, like the stage was done up. They didn't do backdrops. They did LED panels as the backdrops behind us. Like Big moves. They made some plays out here. Big shout out to the Blink Response staff. Oh. They took us to the beach earlier. And honestly, trust I will be back. Maybe we can get Denny to pull up too, man. Can, can we get the Denny and Rod Shaq News Hour out there? Because we need to run that. Oh yeah, yeah. It, so it sounds like it. Yeah, we got we got Blink Esports are you know in in the chat. Yo, shout outs. Well, I got the picture. You know, Rod is saying that he he's down to come through. You know, clearly I missed out. So you're gonna make that make that happen. You know, big ups. But yeah, it sounded like it was, it was, like it was an awesome event with uh, you know, the, the level of professionalism and it sounds like just the overall vibe was on point. Uh, and that's what I'd like to see. You know, because ultimately when it comes to the FGC, mm -hmm. a lot of things are word of mouth. You know, people yeah. go back, you know, after after an event, their experience, they tell their folks about it, folks ask about it, and those kind of things. Yeah, positive word of mouth, that's how things grow into something, um, and they become a staple in the community. Um, and that happens through communication and people, you know, both their playing, their experience, back and forth. It's, it's important. And I think that's that's why when it comes to, I think, some of the disconnect when it comes to esports and FGC sometimes and what people worry about is that some mm -hmm. of that feel will be lost when you start adding in more sponsors or, you know, more of the uh, professional end that might lead into more of the corporate side um, mm -hmm. is how much of that is, you know, tied to the money being uh, advertisers and such and how much is it is the, the actual spirit of the FGC in the grassroots side getting involved. And I feel like something yeah. like this, you know, uh, Selka has, you know, High production value, uh, you know, great tourneys, um, great venue and such. And then you added the word of mouth from the actual players getting involved there. 
you can have some more of that uh, return on investment down the line, hopefully. Yeah, so good and I'm glad you brought I'm glad you brought that up to like the whole concept behind grassroots because I, I think the venue was very much set up in a type of way to where we wanted every game to feel like it had the biggest audience ever, and I think they did a really good job of that. Now, in a traditional like DreamHack fashion, like day one is like. You know, you have like, you know, the arena shooters, the games like that on the really big, big stage, you know, because yeah. those just take a lot of more. That just takes, you know, more time to get put together. You know, you let the brackets run for the fighting games off to the side. And then finals days, you know, you put the FGC on stage and you let that those seats fill up. And, yo, Street Fighter V was looking like early Street Fighter V attendance numbers. Like when it came to seats being filled, they were like moms, kids, grandmas, all types of people mm. pulling up to watch this. And that top eight. I think really spoke volumes to not only like where Street Fighter is, but where it could go. Cause bro, Mena winning, I mean he's like king out here. So him winning that is a big deal. And then of course Smash right after Street Fighter, we had a you know really packed audience as well. Sonic's running that, Capitan Cito in second place too. There's a lot of storylines kind of intertwining. I was like, this is for me. This was peak esports. I was like, this is what it should always look like. It should be commentary that's going to the audience to keep them engaged, to explain it in a way to people who might not even know what's, what's going on, to have something like Yipes and Javits break it down. And then, of course, the, the atmosphere. And then on top of that, the venue was inside of a mall, too. So, like, if you needed a break away and go grab something to eat, it was just yeah, right yeah, there. It was perfect right there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice mix, everything you, everything you would need. Yeah, it sounded sound like you had a, a great time, and it was just, uh, you know, a good time in general for the most part. I mean... That's what we love to love to hear, um, but also, you know, like you mentioned, you got the the, sh- the shooters and such. I know that uh, Yipes is a he's a shooter guy. He's competed before on, on the Call of Duty side of things, so you know, there's definitely crossover on that end too for folks that are in, involved in uh, playing some of those you know those team options, you know, arena shooters and such. Uh, you know, top of fighters, there's plenty of there's plenty of crossover there too uh folks would be surprised you know it's not just fighters the same way you can have your your mahomes and such you know talking about hopping on uh cod last weekend and stuff out you know because they had the bat the bye week um you know plenty of people that play at a high level in one in one type of game are hopping on and doing the same thing on mm-hmm. a different title so there's there's plenty of opportunity there to, to get some of that crossover in you know like like tj mentioned earlier you know, the sky's the limit when it comes to you know putting some of these bigger things together when you've got folks coming in from different genres and everything else. So you love to see it. It's just a good time right now for for gaming uh, in mm. general as we move into the next year and hopefully some major releases uh, down the line. So it should be oh. should be big stuff. That's facts, you know. But before we move, on, I just want to give a big shout as well too to the the whole Blink you know respawn team and also um, Bandits as well too. Um, Chopper, Dante, Snacks, everybody who, you know, helped out with production and commentated like, you all are legends, yo. Beautiful stuff to see. Hope we see it again. Beautiful event. Now, Denny, on the topic of beautiful events, you already know we got to jump into. That wonderful little event that goes on across the pond called Evil Japan just got announced. What are your thoughts on this, man? They just announced the game lineup, the dates, everything. Yeah, uh, you know, Evo, of course, is Evo, but Evo Japan has, you know, also started to kind of uh, make it, its own uh, name for itself for the last couple of years uh, in, in highlighting some of those games that may not always get as much uh, attention on the main stage um, in some other situations, even though that's kind of a, it's kind of tweaked a bit more, I think, since, uh, you know, obviously Guilty Gear has been just killing it this past year. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still games here that, you know, I'm kind of interested in seeing more from uh, this time around. And I don't think that, you know, let's like King of Fighters or Tekken 7 are any surprise to anyone as far as that side goes. But I'm actually interested in seeing kind of how things go with Virtual Fighter because, uh, as people might know, Virtual Fighter 5 Ultimate Showdown uh, came down. Um, it kind of not really came and went, but more so just uh, made the game accessible and uh, available for people to uh, hop on and play on some of the newer systems and such. And it has a really hardcore scene. And also a lot of uh, people who are quite friendly of just kind of uh, helping people kind of get to know the meta and gameplay behind uh, Virtual Fighter in general. 
which I was surprised by. Um, a lot of times you might get some folks who are, you know, in some scenes it might be a little bit more gatekeeper-ish and such, mm. but there's a lot of folks who are really into uh, trying to get people into the, the Virtua Fighter scene, which, you know, Virtua Fighter 5, which has been around what seems like forever. Like, I remember, I feel like I remember playing that game in my dorm room. <laughs> That's how long ago this game has, has been since it came out. Um, but Ultimate Showdown added some nice little tweaks and such, um, and it definitely runs fairly smoothly as far as uh, the online goes. So um, I'm interested in seeing kind of like what the high level gameplay looks like for that on a, a major stage of Evo. Um, King of Fighters has, has kind of quieted down a bit, but I, I definitely think that it's definitely still on the right track in comparison to uh, a bit, I, I guess, like 14, uh, which kind of just kind of seemed like it was kind of in the in the middle or makes it wasn't enough uh, new or different about it in a way that made it stand out in comparison to, to 15. Uh, so I'm interested in seeing some high level play from uh, those games um, in comparison, but you know, street fighter five, especially on the way as we head towards street fighter six next year, it's going to be a big opportunity here for some of the, the major names on the Japan Japanese scene and such, you know, besides your usual Daigos and those kind of things or knees, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of pop up here and 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 make a, a name for themselves. Well, not really a name, but you know, sure they still got it here at the end into the uh, the last kind of run for Street Fighter Five, and of course, Guilty is going to be probably insane to watch <laughs> in general. Oh yeah, there's been plenty of uh, movement there, but so yeah, the lineup is 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 pretty solid. Um, I don't really know much about Melty Blood. I, I have uh, watched a bit, you know, while. Showing outside of pools and such, but the the scene and the uh, fans seem to be hype on that end with uh, Muddy Blood type Lumina. And we got Grand Blue Fantasy uh, versus Grand Blue seemed to have um, made a little bit of noise when it first uh, they first dropped in their game. Uh, mm. And they, they got a dedicated base as well. So a lot of hardcore fans and players here um, in this Japanese lineup. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, how much of, of, of that applies or comes through for Evil Japan. Yeah, I agree, man. You know, and what's weird was I had a very fixated opinion on Virtual Fighter Five. And I think it, it really took me doing the stimulus games with Shaq News to like get my head out of my ass. I was very much one of those tech and elitists, like, <laughs> don't bring virtual around me, like, bro, like we gonna scrap. What are we doing? Like now you know better, but when we really sat down and played it, and I hadn't played it in uh really a long time almost probably around the same time that you know you had started running you know i was playing because i think i'm a little younger than you are my uh, older cousins brought it over they're like yo let's run it i'm like this is cool this is ain't tekken but like reapproaching fighting games with a, a different mindset when you're older or whatever like people sometimes forget about that like yo you can pick up a game when you're young and be like this is too complex for me or maybe it's not complex enough you know go on on your fighting game journey, play other shit that you hate, then circle back around and be like, this actually wasn't that bad. And that's me with Virtual Fighter. I was like, you know what, man? I mean, Japan is already like the king of 3D fighters. I mean, let's just call for what it is. I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of rocking with this. Um, you know, again, we talked about Rick just a little bit ago, like right after TJ left. And, uh, you know, I'm very curious to see, especially from a, a, an event organizer standpoint, the stamp that he's going to put on Evil Japan. Because I think the vibe that it's had since its inception has been it's the evil you can't go to it's the evil you're not gonna be able to make bro so just stay your ass home like but i think rick does a really good job especially of trying to provide just as good of a of a url experience as the irl is now obviously nothing's ever going to be actually pulling up but i'm very curious to see like what the side attractions are going to be like the talk shows the podcast mm -hmm. the um you know the the q and a's that type of stuff because on the website, it says, you know, fighting games originated in Japan, you know, and I think this is kind of like a love letter to that, um, to that, excuse me, that, that style of thinking. And um, I mean, I think this lineup also really reflects how good fighting games are over there. I'm pretty sure Guilty Gear is going to close out the night. Street Fighter Five is going to be absolutely insane. I'm sure everybody, again, wants to be the final champion in that. Tekken 7, of course, never disappoints. And you brought up King of Fighters as well. What is... Let me ask you this. What's missing from King of Fighters, if there is anything missing, that's not giving it like that same Street Fighter and Tekken sort of push? Because like when I see it at an event, I'm like, I'm really happy it's here. But when it's not there, I'm also never asking any questions like, huh, I guess they ain't making it. I don't have that same vibe with Street Fighter and, and Tekken. It's like, yo, where are these games at? So 
Well, I mean, King of Fighters in in general is it's just not. You have to think of, of things in terms of like the. Both the history and like production and those kind of things. Like Street Fighter mm-hmm. is the premier kind of sets the tone for the FCC in general. You can say mm-hmm. what they want, but at the end of the day, Capcom leads things for it when it comes to when they put on another Street Fighter. You can see it just how much of an impact it has on the other games around it. You know, like, mm-hmm. if you look at Mortal Kombat 11 in comparison to MKX. What happened between those two games? Street Fighter Five happened, <laughs> and MK11 uh, has definitely been impacted on the quote unquote footsie side when it comes to um, Mortal Kombat 11 in comparison. So I think the similar things happen with uh, King of Fighters, which you know had a dedicated scene and such, but it's also been known for having uh, a very technical side when it comes to both playstyle and you have to you have to learn more characters because you have team based fighting happening. You know, there's going to be you know your three your three v three and your switch outs with uh, characters and stuff like that. But also, King of Fighters has also been known for having some of the worst netcode on the planet in, in in previous renditions like king of fires 13 and such were like impossible to play online basically mm. so your your competitive scene had to develop offline basically in most cases but king of fires itself is massive in like mexico you know and, and uh like a lot of the uh, latino countries and stuff like that latin america like they have a huge scene it's just that when it comes to like playing against each other um Guilty Gear has led the charge when it comes to uh, rollback netcode and stuff like that with the with uh, with Strive, and I think that that's where every fighting game should be hitting moving forward. And if that it ends up being the case, then we'll, I think we'll see a bit more of a shift happening with some of the other games like your King of Fighters and such, and uh, you know Virtual Fighters and those kind of things. But the fact that Virtual Fighter even made it on the list, I think that's more of like Rick's impact saying, "Hey, if we're really going to be showing some." some dedication to the scene and the history of Japanese, you know, fighting games and stuff like that, then having Virtual Fighter on this list um, gives people an opportunity to see it on the main stage again in a way that yeah. uh, will be entertaining. Uh, because for me, yes, Tekken is awesome, but I remember playing Virtual Fighter on my cousin the Sega Saturn. So yeah. <laughs> that is a complete different different vibe there, especially when it comes to the competitive scene and the over arcade scene because Virtual Fighter used to have massive like arcade cabinets and such, you know, back in Virtual Fighter two and three, those kind of things. Um so there's definitely a, a big impact on the Japanese side, even though the arcades themselves have been shutting down left and right. And uh, that scene's not really as, as big there anymore. I think having that as part of the like the uh you know, mixture of a, a bit of a nostalgia tour is uh a big move. Um, and there is also the fact that the thing that's curious to me is that this game is dropping at the end of March or the, uh, the actual event. And uh-huh. that is, uh, that is quite the tame table. Cause if, uh, if I remember correctly, let me just double check, do some, some okay. quick, some quick research here. Um, let's see if I, if, okay. So that's, that's the same, that's basically the the week after Resident Evil Four remake drops and a few other oh. things on the Capcom end. So there's been uh, talks that Street Fighter Six would not drop before Resident Evil Four. Um, so that being said, we'll have to keep an eye out for like both Evil Japan and any kind of Capcom Cup announcements and those kind of things because we might get some more info about. Street Fighter Six. Um, after that, that point of time, because since this is going to be the week after Resident Evil Four drops, and you know, as we report it here at Shag News, that it's looking like there won't be any Street Fighter Six releases happening before Resident Evil Four does in that first quarter. That's right. Might, it would not surprise me if you know maybe there's some kind of Street Fighter related content or news coming out of Evil Japan. Um. But we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and I'm actually really glad before we move on that you brought up, you know, Rick's kind of love letter to the, J- the Japanese scene. I think in a world where esports is so dominant and it's such a heavy filter over what the grassroots scene is, there's people like Rick who can, you know, kind of sit through the BS and, you know, kind of see the world in matrix coding like, hey, man, nah, like we're running Virtual Fighter 5. 
And, uh, you know, we even see it like at his own events with Combo Breaker. He's like, look, man, we're going to find a way to run this Killer Instinct. We're going to find a way to run this Mortal Kombat 9 because it just makes sense here. Just like how at CEO is like, yo, we're going to find out a way to run this Def Jam fight for New York. Even if we got to put it in Jabali Land or whatever, we're going to do that. And uh, we just need to see a little bit more of that. You know, not everything needs to be about the money. And I, I'm saying that, you know, kind of loosely, but. People got to get paid. Games got to get ran. But Virtual Fighter 5 is just so hard to ignore. Now, Danny, on the top of the things that are hard to ignore, the Project L roster, did that just leak? Or am I tripping, bro? Did that just leak? <laughs> yeah, like I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we were talking with TJ. Uh, it seems like that's what's going down here. Now, I mean, we did a pretty thought rundown because TJ definitely knows more about the characters than I do. But... You know, the impact of Project L in general, I feel like, is going to be uh, massive. I mean, we got an opportunity here for both a new fighting game franchise in the scene from a, a company that has both the time and money um, to put into it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if they either run their rendition where they have Project L supported at, you know, your combo breakers and, you know, at your CEOs and such. Um, and if they eventually bring on a Riot Fest type situation where they've got their own one-two punch between, you know, League or, you know, Runeterra and, and Project L all running uh, simultaneously with a, a big scene, um, the same way that Cutcom has Cutcom Cup and stuff like that. Um, if the game itself is actually good and, you know, builds a solid fan base, you might start to see a bit of shakeup as far as, like, where the power standings are with the, the other ones. I mean, obviously, your Tekkens and your Guilty Gears and your Street Fighters are massive. And I'm not saying that Riot should take this as an opportunity to go head-to-head with a Street Fighter Six release or anything like that. But as far as, uh, you know, really making a wave, if you start bringing out some so, some solid prize pools, um, folks will take advantage. Uh, and if you get some, some big names and players involved, you know, even if it's from an exhibition standpoint, you know, some of these characters and stuff like that that may have leaked. You 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 start to kind of see people take more interest just based off of like their favorite players getting involved in the scene. You may not you know have any kind of background in league and those kind of things, but if they're pulling off some sick combos or something like that, and there's money involved, it could be a shift easy. Um, so right now, as far as like the overall leak goes, I don't think it's really I don't think this really hurts Riot or you know the team in the same way it might. Um, with other games because we have no idea how these characters play. Um, but that being said, TJ did bring up some of those uh, characters and how they might play down the line, but it's just not enough seen from the overall game right now um, to really know where that's going to go. Um, now, if this had been several months after we had saw gameplay and some of that stuff going down, it might be a different story, but since it's so early on, I feel like for the league side of things or league fans who may have been the type who would buy Mortal Kombat and play it for two weeks and then that's it, they might be more enticed to play based off of this roster um, just because they, they see uh, characters they recognize or know. Um, but I don't think it's going to have the same effect on, you know, the, the types that might snoop around a fighting game looking for details and, you know, whether uh, Ryu has the same shuriken or something like that. We don't have that kind of impact yeah. here because there's no... <laughs> none of these characters have been used before in a fighting game. So... Um, I think this is more for, like, the fans who, you know, play League. They get hype about their favorite character potentially being in the game. And again, this is a leaked roster, potentially, but League has so many characters that they could change things up at any time, or they could be a DLC, could move things around. We have no idea on that end what might, might go down. It's a good point, man. Um, we, we really don't. And to rewind a little bit, this is going to be Riot's first time really having to play nice uh, with another company. And what I mean by that is, you know, Riot could drop a million dollars and do their own thing, like how they've been doing, you know, their own circuits and, and tourneys and stuff. But if you really want a fighting game to grow, we got to take it back to the very nature that made the arcade era what it was. And that is the community. That is working with people, being as transparent as possible, you know, and just being polite. You know, I mean, we've seen it all those years ago. Just as simple as, hey, man, um, see, you're running Street Fighter. You want to run some real quick? I got quarters. Like, that sort of thinking needs to be implemented when you, you know, come over to the FGC because we are very quick to fight back. It's what we're good at doing. And, um, 
you know, obviously, there's no doubt in my mind that they're not going to do a um, their own circuit. But yeah. in that circuit, of course, I'd imagine they have a uh, combo breaker, um, Evo, CEO, stuff like that on their mind with partnering with, you know, running their game. And they're going to have to make sure that they approach these games and these communities properly because with how much hoopla, how much talk has been surrounded around these games, or excuse me, this title, this Project L, there's so many people in the community that are like, I bet this game is just going to force its way into the top and it's going to get the final spots involved. Like, there's a lot of naysayers and a lot of people who are ready to push back. So I think when Riot does make that initial leap over to the FDC, like physically, just making sure that they work well with the organizers on a level that's deeper than just money. Because we know that the Riot FDC events print money. It's not about that. Um, mm -hmm. Me personally, I also don't know anything about these characters as I don't play League of Legends. Um, but just looking at the overall design, just kind of the concept that goes into um, bringing these characters to life, I get it. You know, there's so much influence from Riot, there's so much influence from League of Legends, and now we get to see these characters, or TFT and games like that as well. We're finally getting a chance to see these characters in 3D form. Very similar to, like, Smash. Like, some characters only ever existed in 8-bit form, and then, boom, here they are, fully rendered 3D, 1080p. Um, very excited to see how it's all going to go down when it drops. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we'll definitely have to get some more insight from folks like TJ or, you know, they they have uh, definitely walked the line on both sides, from the Riot and, and League side and on the uh, FUC side as well. But, you know, speaking of things, those potential plans for Riot down the line is going to need some presentation and commentary. And... One of the big things that, you know, became a topic of conversation this past week has been how can commentating or commentators uh, become better when it comes to both entertaining and providing info for the audience? What can commentators do to get people more into the game or what they're watching instead of, you know, potentially watching things on mute? And I thought that would be a, a decent conversation to have with our very own commentator here, Ronnie himself, who's, uh, you know... Work that stage and is coming back, you know, from working a different event. But yeah, do you, you know, do you have any thoughts or insight on what you think, you know, could be done in the future that, you know, from a commentator's perspective or even from the presentation side to maybe provide more entertainment for the audience or more insight in a way that uh, benefits both the game, the event, and then everything else going on there uh, in comparison to what you're seeing right now, both on the Smash scene and just in general? So first of all, let's go ahead and read this person's um, tweet that you linked. I'm really happy that you linked this. Jonathan M. at home, at Cloud805. Some friends and I last night were talking about how they watch most events muted. I asked why they responded, because the commentators. I've seen, other I've seen others mention that they do this as well. What can some current and newer commentators improve on for you to unmute them? <clears throat> I think commentators will always be open to proper criticism, especially from their fellow commentators. They should look at their own VODs, seeing what they need to work on, and maybe stray away from the matches too often or only commentators, or only, excuse me, only commentate what's happening on the screen. Thoughts? I forgot to add what, that I would really like to see commentators stop giving credits to players when a player drops a combo and gets an accident reset. They go to give them credit saying it was intentional or anything similar to the case. No, they didn't. It was just a happy accident. Now, with the exception of that final tweet, the first two tweets addressing why things are muted. I think fighting games particularly, have they have a bit of an issue with commentary. Um, I think it's what I know versus how it's presented. You know, when you look at a game like Street Fighter, we look at a game like Tekken or Dragon Ball or anything like that, you know, Obviously, we need to know what's going on. There needs to be a way to relay the information in a way to people who are in the game competitively will understand what you're saying. But also, if I decided to kick it with my grandma, I was like, hey, grandma, we're about to watch Dragon Ball. It can be explained in a way that she'll pick up on. Maybe not as quick, obviously, but she'll get some things. Mm -hmm. I always look at commentary personally like a performance. Um, I come from a performance background. Commentary is improv, just like how streaming you know, when you go live on Twitch, it's, it's a it's a game of improv. And improv can always be strengthened. It is the frontal cortex lobe of the brain, the part of the brain that we don't like using. It's the part of the brain that we use when we get speeches and we get nervous and we start talking with our hands and we have to impromptu. 
that is improv. And unfortunately enough, commentators are performing on stream much longer than some of our favorite celebrities. Like as much as I love Bruno Mars and Beyonce and all these people, like they are given a big performance, but it's a set list and they know what they're gonna do when they're gonna do it every night. I am on commentary telling you what's happening as it's happening, breaking down information quick. It's coming out very fast. And I think because of how hectic the actual performance is, sometimes people lean into bad habits. There are some people who just want to get through the block as quickly as possible. So they're like, let me just be the numbers guy. You know, sometimes the numbers commentators are boring. You know, yes, this move is frame three or frame one. But there's a difference between saying it boring and then saying it like how Yipes or Tasty Steve is going to say it. It's frame one, but give me something with it. And then there's also the hype guys who sometimes don't give you anything. Thankfully enough, in fighting games, commentators are pretty good at that. But there are, you know, some who slip through the cracks who are all hype and they don't give you anything at all on the mic. I think, like this person said, going back, looking at your VODs and treating it like a performance is what needs to be done. And that's what people don't want to do because it's uncomfortable, Denny. Denny, bro, I'd imagine you know a lot about music. How many interviews have you listened to where musicians are like, I hate going back and listening to myself saying, I think I sound terrible. I think I, I hate the way I wrote that. Mm -hmm. But like, that needs to be done for growth. And there's not enough of that. It's not even enough for commentators to hold other commentators accountable. There has to be somebody who's in charge of you being hired that needs to tell you, yo, bro, you want to work this event? We need like a spooky, like a Chris Seg, like a, a Jabali or somebody like, yo, you want to work this event? I'll tell you right now, this commentary was not good. Here's some examples. Practice up. If nothing else, people out here listening to this, wanting to get into commentary, take an improv class. Do not jump on that mic all stiff and all, you know, just jumbled up. Get comfortable with being afraid. Get comfortable with the unknown. That's what improv is all about because you don't know what's going to happen on screen. So you got to just lean into that. Yeah, that's, a good, um, that's a good point. You know, I wanted to bring yeah. up something else here. I saw in the the reply to the thread um, mm -hmm. from Cloud805, and someone said, not all try to be yipes. Often everyone is trying to be the funny man, and it's just exhausting to listen to, or they treat it like their podcast. It's fine if they're killing dead air, but I really do want to focus on the match. So do you think, you know, because there, there are definitely a breakdown, I think, when it comes to, uh, you know, balance. And you see it even mm -hmm. in wrestling, for example, where there's your color commentator, and then you've got someone who's, you know, pulling out the technical one in the straight man, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's helpful for someone to be able to kind of relay both sides of that and have one that they more so focus or specialize in? Or do you think that you should be, you know, basically hired for you get a color commentary or being the technical guy who's going to be able to tell you, you know, the breakdown or frame data and those kind of things during the match? No, nah, man, I'm I think the beauty of improv is uh, there's a rule called yes and. And the yes and rule is what keeps the conversation going. Denny, um, I'm, I know you've been on dates before I've been on dates. It's all about active listening. What did she say? And I'm formulating my response based off of the active listening I just learned or I, I just used to hear what she said. And now I'm forming my next point that way. Oftentimes on commentary, people get so caught up in the roles that it's like, I can only be this. I can only be the numbers guy. And then there's other people where I can only be the hype guy. But what ends up happening is that, and we've seen it, at some recent events, there's just two people talking about the match at the same time and no direct conversation back and forth. There needs to when people hear that both people are synced up and they're talking back and forth, that sells the experience. If I'm listening and I'm like, well, Denny's telling me about the frame out of here, then here's this weird jump in and like there's no for, no flow of conversation, but things get weird. This is why like James Chen and Ultra David are so well together, like Yipes and Pai Lee Chung, Tasty Steven Sajam, you know, TK and EE, there's that back and forth. Um, and even if one guy's the hype guy, one guy's the numbers guy, there's always a way to segue it back into what's happening. If I'm hype and I'm bringing it, boom, 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 like, man, he's fucking him up. You know, Zangief, gray hand, boom. The numbers guy's like, yes. And let me tell you a little bit about that gray hand. That gray hand has been an absolute detriment through the entirety of this match. The other side just can't deal with it. And it's just that. But that's what we're missing. And I think that's why commentators get put on mute because they're just not synced up in their performance. They're just... Mm -hmm. Let's just say a bunch of shit, Danny, for two hours, and then let's get off the mic and go home. It's not so, good. So, so do you think that, you know, there should be more of a focus on the pairings, having uh, prep time beforehand from the, you know, organization side? 
Or should it be more of a situation where, uh, you know, they just prepare it in general? Because I feel like, you know, people get hired on regardless of combination. And sometimes some folks either first time working together or they're just not necessarily paired together normally. But, A, they were within the budget for what they need to do for a particular event. And so they, here they are mm-hmm. working together. Do you think that should be a scenario where, like, uh, that pairing is, is taking that into consideration and they're talking to each other before ever going, um, you know, on the commentary stage together? Or is it more mm-hmm. of a situation where, like, you know you should be prepared regardless, uh, individually. You know, you should be prepared. You should be prepared to expect the unexpected, you know, but there are some very key moments in, in smash and fighting game commentary specifically where, you know, there are some set things that need to be said. So like, for instance, like before we go live on most blocks, like if you and I were to commentate together, I would ask you, Hey, do you want to open? Do you want to throw the commercial? Who do you want to be? You know, it's like, okay, boom, Daddy's going to open. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Shaq News. This is the Stimulus Games. $5,000 in pop bonuses on the line. It's Daddy's Rob. Boom. Very simple stuff. Um, I think a lot of times, too, man, um, what people should do that they aren't doing is do a little bit of research. Now, obviously, there are commentators who are, like, super big that, like, okay, I know this guy's style. But also, to be at that level of work, they have to also know that you can't just be like, let's, I'll just use James Chan for an example. Like, he's like commentary tofu. He can take on the form of most roles. So if I'm super hyped, I know that James Chen, a more experienced commentator than me, is going to be like, okay, I'm going to have to adjust a little bit to his play style. Like, we can still give the performance, but let's try to meet in the middle here. I'm usually like this, but I'm going to bring it this way and still kind of keep it fun. Yeah. Um, what I do sometimes with, like, Max and I, for instance, We'll do like a like an improv warm up, something as simple as just freestyling. I'll do eight bars. He'll pass it back to me. I'll pass it back to him, and that syncs us up. That gets us comfortable with fucking up. Like on commentary, there's there's such this like this pressure of being perfect. Oh man, I got the frame data wrong. Or, oh man, I didn't deliver that properly. That is the beauty of the improvisational performance. Is that you're gonna mess up. It's live. There's no script. Once people remove the concept of fear and all of that. You become way more comfortable in the mic, and you get to play your role, whatever role that is, to the best of your ability. And I'd, I'd like to see that more, man. I'm glad actually you sent this thread over because these are some thoughts that I've actually had for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you know you're dropping some some key knowledge here as well for folks that may be interested in trying to get more involved in the commentary scene. So you know, going off of that, if you had like say one or two. Uh, things in general you think that could be fixed overall from the commentator and let's say one thing that on the commentator side and one thing from the organization side to make things better for the for the uh, audience entertainment uh what would those things be um i think what hurts fighting game commentary sometimes and this is what makes league and even like some sportscasters um you know, basically get the checks that they get is the fact that they are not only performing to the Twitch chat, but they're also performing to the audience as well. And once you start to realize that there are actual real human beings listening to what you're saying in the room as it's happening, that will make you shape up. And if you fuck up, that will make you want to be better. You could say something wrong on Twitch. You know what I'm saying? The Twitter monsters that get you for a couple of days, whatever. But that immediate person to person feedback of, damn, bro, like you didn't deliver that one right. And people in the audience are kind of looking at you funny. That makes you want to be better. I think all commentators need to take an improv class. If you all, if you don't already got the, like some people are born with the sauce. Like you got like people like Taste Steve and like, you know, Yipes who are just, they just grew up in it. You know what I'm saying? Like they just, they're quick, you know what I'm saying? Very, you know, smart on the fly, boom. But not everybody's like that. There are some people who are really timid, really shy, who are like, I know so much. I sing so well. But man, when I get on stage, I freeze up. Take some classes, like open up a little bit more. The knowledge ain't going anywhere. Just mm-hmm. strengthen that frontal cortex low, get quicker, you know what I'm saying? Get sharper on your delivery. And you'll yeah. be good to go. That's all, man. Working on your craft there. All right, that's yeah. definitely good advice. Um, so you got you got anything that you like to see improve from like the organization side when it comes to commentating or like uh, you know, getting commentators? Uh, you know, ready to roll, those kind of things, something that, you know, might be a pet peeve for you? Um, I like to see all tournaments do house commentary. And I think we live in a day and age in esports where if the players are affected by it, tell the motherfuckers to put on headphones. I ain't trying to hear that. 
like players you can't demand better commentary and then say you don't want to hear it through house i'm sorry commentary through house is what's going to make these commentators better people's deliveries are too dry too slow too this too that like and it's all because they're only commenting to people on the internet so you're not worried about the people in the audience there's just people just sitting around just watching these people play you go to a wrestling event i know you go to a lot you can hear the commentary sometimes you know you go to a sporting event that's what sells the experience um it's it's a performance at the end of the day and in that performance people need to be a hundred percent enthralled into what's happening and that's how you do it um for the tos i mean i've been doing this for a while so like i can work with pretty much most people but i personally would like to see um to see more of a heads up on who I'll be working with. I think over in Smash, you know, there's pretty much like the same set of people you're gonna see every week. So, you know, it's kind of good at this point. But every so often, like, you know, an event will throw you a curveball, like, hey, here's my boy from back at home. I was like, okay, cool, yeah, that's dope. Um, is it possible? Just like how we do here at Shaq News, can I just sit down with them for a little bit, pick his brain, you know what I'm saying, see what his vibes are? It just gives me a better heads up on what to bring to the table. It's like it's like Batman, for example. Like I'm, I got my contingency plan on deck, but like if shit goes sideways, I got a couple other ways I can really like handle the unknown. And um, yeah, like I'm pretty easy to please though. But those are some of the things I like to see. Yeah, I mean, I think you you brought up plenty of uh, good opportunities, plenty of, plenty of things that people can definitely chat more about. And I hope that some folks, you know, learn some of those things. Definitely spend some time. You know, focus it on your craft, on the performance side. Like you said, taking some classes, those kind of things, if this is really something you want to do, hey, that goes a long way to standing out in the crowd, especially with uh, the kind of year we have, you know, coming up here where there might be several different games you can dive into. They're going to have, uh, you know, needs for tons of commentary, I'm, I'm sure, between multiple events. But, you know, th- thanks for that uh, that that conversation there from Rod. Give a round of applause there for coming through with that one. We got a couple more things to cover through uh, before we before we hit into soft talk and such. But you know, I take a little moment here just to say, you know, if you're here and you want to see more content um, like this and uh, more overall gaming news, make sure to follow us on all the social medias. We have you know Shack News on Facebook, Shack News Media on Instagram. You know, we can see some of that, that fly uh, content from Worlds 2022 we just put up uh, ShackNews uh, dot com, which is. Uh, where you can catch some 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 new content. We just put up the the review for Sonic Frontiers, and uh, Morgan loved it apparently. So you know, if you want to see uh, some more action from that or some of the other uh, you know gameplay previews that we had recently, uh, head over to ShackNews.com. Uh, of course, Shack News Games and Gamer Hub videos on YouTube, which uh, you know we have plenty of awesome YouTube content, uh, video content, and highlights uh, from games that are dropping soon, uh, and we'll have some pretty nice ones from God of War. For those of you who might be uh, hopping in on that one on Wednesday, uh, make sure you come through for some of that action. And of course, you can uh, come say hi to me on the Twitters and such as well, uh, at Shaq News over on Twitter, uh, where we uh, hopefully will still be able to get the most out of our check mark in the next uh, couple of days with the Elon Musk situation going on right now. But as of right now, uh, Twitter is still the place to be for some of that content. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we got pretty much uh, the last of our, our news bits here, just a little bit left in the uh, eSports rundown of the cover before we head over to Sauce Talk for some more uh, food chatter. Um, but let's uh, let's slide through to it before we move on to the next uh, next thing here. But Now, we, we talked about commentary, Denny, and I, I can't think of uh, you know another event that has great fighting game commentary than Melee Summit. Um, you know, Melee Summit, of course, one of the best events ever. Yeah. Um, you know, doing one of the best esports ever, but <clears throat> I think it's the commentary and the style of bracket that it's in is what really sells the event and the overall experience. Um, you know, I I can't think of a better storybook ending than May- Mango winning any damn thing in Smash. So, Mango of course wins Summit uh, just this past weekend, and what a treat that was to see. Of course, Mango being the not the self-proclaimed goat. People kind of gave him that title. He is the goat, regardless of how much he wins or loses. A goat has nothing to do with stats. It has all to do with the impact and how you revitalize the genre of whatever it is that you're in. Like Michael Jordan, for instance. You can outstats Michael Jordan. He's still the goat. Mango is definitely just that. Second place, IBDW. Third place, AMSA. 
Shout out to VG Bootcamp, of course. And then, of course, fourth place, the industry baby goat himself, Mr. Hungrybox. Um, I mean, wow. This top eight here, kind of a mix of, you know, or top four, excuse me, kind of a mix of old guard and new guard, IBDW kind of coming in here in the last so many years. Mango, Omson, Hungrybox, of course, has been in this a while. And uh, also just big shout, of course, to the Smash Summit 14 team for um, for the thing. You know, they did NASA the Ultimate, got the circus. Like, we had the homies dressed up as clowns and shit on theirs. But Melee <laughs> got, we got the Fantastic Four cool blue suits to the moon and stuff. So, I don't know. I got some questions. But regardless, Mango won. Now, I linked something really fast. Like, I know we got to, you know, get to Sauce Talk pretty soon. About the lifetime set count between arguably two of the most influential players in Melee ever, and that's Mango and, of course, HBox. Now, phase one, and this is Mango and HBox as small children here. They look shit much younger than me. It looks like Mango was 7 and 0 on Hungrybox. That's right, the 7 0 whitewash. Looks like uh, it looks like a Gigabits 2 0. Gen- the first Genesis, that's right, kiddos. There was a Genesis 1, believe it or not. Wins 2 0. And then wins again 3-0. That must have been sometime in top eight. Winterfest 3-1. Another Winterfest one later on, I'd imagine. 3-1. Pound 4. Oh, my God. I'm getting so old. Both 3-1s. Let me move on to phase two. Hungrybox starts to figure some things out. Mango's still winning 7-3. But Mango, or Hungrybox was able to kind of put some, uh, some points on the board for himself at an event called Don't Go Down There, Jeff. That's before my time. Apex 2012. And NorCal Regionals 2013. Going over to the next one, Mango's winning the sets. And this is between 2013 and 15. A very pivotal time in Smash because we're leaving like that grassroots era, which we're still kind of in. And we're leaning more into like Smash 4. Nintendo's kind of sort of playing ball with us, but not really. So it was a very pivotal time in esports. Mango is winning between 2013 and 15, 11-1. That's pretty goddamn fucked. Um, and I love Hungry Box of Death, but Mango was just in his bag. Last but certainly not least here, things get a little closer. In fact, they start to lean more on Xbox's favor. Xbox winning lifetime sets here in phase four, 15 to 13. Um, with their most recent encounter being the big house. Or no, this isn't their most recent encounter. This is just phase four. Well, either way. The last one on this list is Shine 2017 with Hungrybox actually beating Mango 3-2. So this is where Hungrybox is starting to kind of come into himself and become the industry monster he is. Um, wow. Yep. Don't know who gathered those stats, but shout out to them. That's, that's quite a that's quite a history there <laughs> to be able to pull up. But, I mean, clearly there's been some solid back and forth happening as we go along, which is uh, pretty interesting. Oh, um, actually, let me take that back. This was Austin of the senior managing editor for Team Liquid, who oh, actually put okay. this together. So, big thank you to Austin. Yeah, so some uh, some solid uh, follow-up there, for sure. I mean, it looks like mm-hmm. Mango and HBox going back and forth at it um, for quite some time. Uh, overall, it, it seems like I did see a bit of a summit conversation on my just general TO overall, um, and it, it did some, some, uh, some huge numbers on Twitch. Uh, from what I've ever seen this past weekend. So, you know, when it does come to some of the Smash team, there's definitely still some pull there. But, you know, with Mango being Mango, uh, seems like he's he's definitely still got got what it takes. Um, now, in general, before we move on to, uh, I think, the last bit here, which is the eSports injury story. Um, but we're hitting towards... Uh, fall slash winter moving forward here um do you think this is this is kind of the downtime now for uh players um as we head towards the the last seasons of the year um or are they going to really grind out um in the next few events um you know i talked to fatality actually just the other day about this and i told him that I think players of all stature should certainly rally together about the convoluted scheduling that is Smash. And the rabbit hole goes very deep. And it starts at at two very key points, of course, that we won't go super deep into. It goes into Nintendo not wanting to get involved and, of course, Smash not being 
anything worthy enough for the man in the overalls to get involved. Um, I don't know which one came first, like a chicken and egg thing, but regardless, we need to rally because we have allowed the community to be self-governed by these pivotal influential figures in the community. Of course, we have seen how that has gone for us these last so many years, but now it has turned into two tours, two very perfectly ran tours. Like I have no issues with them, but the fact that we have two running simultaneously, partnering with the same events and then other events that aren't on the other one, and then they're a week apart, we have to be thinking about the, uh, you know, we gotta be thinking about the community. Now, in the realm of business, People try to tell you that business isn't competitive, that we're not worried about the other side or whatever. McDonald's is very much worried about what Burger King's doing. Walgreens is very much worried about what CBS is doing and so on and so forth. I mean, yeah, um, if you aren't, then that would be a stupid business if you're not watching the competition. Yeah, that's facts. And I, this is what I would want. And this is just me using a little bit of industry prowess that I have. I would love for, you know, BTS, Panda, and VG to really sit down and figure out how do we create a cohesive enough schedule to where our players don't feel burnt out. They don't feel upset about going to a tournament. Like, they come through. You know, they should be, you know, battle-tested. You know, they should have a stack schedule, but it shouldn't be every weekend. Now, Denny, I did glitch at the end of September, first attack at the top of October, had one week off, went to uh, Let's Make Moves Miami. I'm here right now in Santo Domingo. Mm -hmm. Next weekend, I got to go to Seattle. Next weekend's back to Jersey. And the only weekend I have off is just for the holiday if December goes the way of me being hired. And that's just not okay. We got to slow this shit down. Um, I would like the colder months to be the slower time. In the past, that's what it kind of was. But January is let's make big moves in, in New York. And then there's Glitch in Maryland the next weekend. Then there's Genesis at the end of the month. So this shit's not stopping, man. And I don't like it. Yeah, I love that's, being hired. Like, I love working, ridiculous. but it's ridiculous. <laughs> Especially when you consider that people may actually have, you know, opportunities or jobs outside of just the scene. And, you know, family time. I mean, I feel like you're starting to, starting to cut in on holiday time and that kind of stuff where people do travel. Or there's other things in, in, in mind besides just your individual competitiveness and, you know, working to get those points for the league and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of getting out of hand. I feel like, you know, obviously I understand that this, this brings in uh, a ton of revenue for the people involved uh, in different ways. Um, and also keeps, you know, smash relevant to a certain extent with the, with what's going down. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like if, you know, your, your scene's not ending until December and then you're starting right back up again in January, that's not that's not the sign of something that's going to be sustainable without some kind of uh, burnout uh, happening down the line. Yeah, I would certainly like the players to just go on a bit of a strike or something and just say, hey, you know, we get it. Everybody wants to be the one with the tour or like the cool invitational style events. And I really love those. I love the fact that we have these as options now. But the fact that nobody's really working together is what's really hurting us. And over in Street Fighter, there's like E-League, there's the Capcom Pro Tour, Red Bull does stuff. Everybody schedules really well around each other. It's perfectly fine. Over here, though, shit's kind of weird. That's all I got to say about it, Danny. You know my take on it. Austin has had a very similar take as well, too. Like, it's just, it just needs to slow down. That's just period, you know? I mean, I feel like even from the viewership perspective, like, there's just too much. I mean, there's certain content that I like to watch weekly. I'll watch my, you know, I'll watch, you know, some AEW on Wednesdays or whatever, but AEW is not pushing out three, four shows a week, you know, the same way that like when people are like, how are you not watching WWE, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, they've got three hours of Raw on Monday, two hours of SmackDown on, on Friday, two hours of NXT on Tuesday. A lot of people aren't catching that much, you know, wrestling content. They're going to watch some highlights and they're going to watch, you know, maybe one of the shows. But you're asking a lot from the audience, you know, to be coming in and out, you know, week to week. And it's going to be more and more crossover as we move into some of these games dropping, your Street Fighter 6s and such. You know, when Tekken 8 drops, I mean, you know, good luck trying to put out something every weekend against that kind of that kind of crowd if there's something else going down in that scene. Um, you know, obviously Red Bull and those kind of things have their different events, but, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of competitive nature. And I feel like outside of majors and stuff like that, uh, there should be more of a balance for... Players and not feel like they're, you know, especially just because of, uh, you know, sponsors and those kind of things, 
you don't need to see them playing every week. You don't even see 2K League Day, that kind of stuff. There's always an offseason. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that has to apply to, you know, Smash moving forward as well, just to make sure that uh, players are both healthy and that we're not seeing more people kind of popping out with, you know, tweet longers or something like that, saying that they have to, you know, take some time for the mental health and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's telling you that there, there's a little bit too much going on here and it's not a good a good sign for anyone. Um, no, it's it's certainly not. Now I know we got this last one here, and honestly, I'm afraid to even throw it up because I can't find a source that's not on somebody else's publication. But uh, I really wish Asif was here for this. I'm sure he'd have a lot to say. But uh, Halo's very own Matt Booty's uh, thoughts on Halo's release, and he's quoted saying that we kind of dropped the ball, fumbled the bag, you know, did not acquire the cheddar, whichever way you want to, you know, word it. But he just. Wasn't particularly happy. And honestly, I think he speaks for a lot of people um, in that space. You know, Halo, we just covered, you know, finals just a few weeks ago. Um, it was fun. Like, it was super fun. It was cool. But, um, you know, the game just really quickly just needs to be better. Um, hopefully that they can use this year as a learning experience between what happened at HES Kansas City with, you know, you banning or finding a player that spoke out about the game. Matt, not Matt, but, you know, HES in general. The casual scene having issues with it. Us over here at Shaq News not being super fond of what's going down here. Matt Booty, if you're listening to this, you know, just reevaluate with the team. That's all we ask. You know, takes take some time. Yeah, uh, you know, despite what the amount of issues that have gone down with Halo Infinite and such, maybe just Halo Infinite, but even when it comes down to the uh, the TV show. Um, you know, there's been a lot of different, inf- uh, you know, issues and impacts that have caused some issues with uh, how people perceive Halo as a as a whole. Um, that being said, you know, there is an update coming out, uh, you know, that people will be able to take part in. It looks like uh, tomorrow. So Forge, those kind of things will have, a, have an actual beta as well that people will be able to try out. Um, so there are some changes coming to Halo, and it seems like that the winter update They've kind of outlined with a, a massive video. I want to say it was like 13 minutes or so, just going mm. over some of the changes for the game and stuff like that. So there are there are some conversations happening at least when it comes to the future of Halo. It's just that the I don't know where you know if morale overall is is very high for for things. Uh, we did you know have a Halo Championship Series on the show uh, you know the previous week. But um, and there's there's still money there um, to be had. So the competitive scene is still a thing. But what, it'll be interesting to kind of see if uh, there's a bit of a shift as far as interest when it comes to that scene moving forward. Because you have games that are obviously going to have quite an impact themselves. Your Call of Duty's and such, you know, Call of Duty League is going to be a big deal um, this uh, season around as well. With Modern Warfare Two becoming the largest, I guess. Uh, you know, release for the Call of Duty franchise of like something ridiculous, like 800 million copies or so um, in that opening week. So it, clearly Call of Duty is not going anywhere and it's going to be another staple for Xbox moving forward after their recent purchase um, of Activision. So uh, Halo, we'll have to see uh, where the scene goes from there. But yeah, um, yeah, let's slide into some sauce talk before we head out of here because there's always it's always some food to talk about. Let's uh, get it. And of course, you know, Rod is the one that, that chose these stories this week. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The 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 ever so elusive Awesome Khan actually linked this first, <laughs> so I just happened to throw it in the run and show. Now, you know what's funny is like, you know, we'll drop topics all week, but when Awesome drops like a food one, it's like, oh, like, either this is something that's about to get dunked on, or this is something we're going to start salivating over. So, uh, this first one, of course, uh, is the best cities um, for sandwich lovers. It says, Americans have been consuming sandwiches for 200 years, and regional varieties have spread out to every city. Sandwich shops and delis uh, are and offer various of, or for, excuse me, variations of sub, hoagies, and grinders, and more. I've never heard a sandwich called a grinder before. Grinders, that's weird. Oh, yeah, grinders, Among right, the 700. Right largest cities in the u.s there these are the best cities for sandwiches and sandwich availabilities now denny you and i we go back and forth about our various hot food takes what's your take on this list man well okay um I, I, looking through some of the the you know choices there now they said among 700 largest in the u.s 
So I'm assuming that, like, I don't know. I just kind of wish that they had more detail about, like, how they put together, like, the, the listing. But looking at the overalls, you know, I have been to several of these. So I will say that, I, that it gives me a bit more perspective. Um, I had a really good sandwich in D.C., so I do think of that. You know, that could potentially be one that's worth putting on a list on that end. Um, I, I do remember having a memorable sandwich while I was there. It was several years ago, but it was also um, around around uh, inauguration. Um, I want to say for Obama's second term. And the, uh, while I was out there, we had a, I had a phenomenal sandwich uh, at that time, that time period. Um, that being said, with some of the other listings, uh I don't know. I don't have much of a commentary on some of like like the Florida locations uh, on the list because there's like I want to say there's like three or four Floridas on this list, which is a, a little bit questionable yeah. to me. I'm like, you know uh, what? Florida is not at this, like I'm, that. No, it's not. I'm gonna actually look up the dude who wrote this list while you're going on. <laughs> I want to see where this band is from. Watch this man be from Florida or something. Uh, Marietta, Georgia was number nine on this list. Um, in which case, uh, they said that uh, sandwiches are a comfort food and a way of life. So, sure, such is true with Marietta, Georgia, and Edge City. That's Atlanta's sixth largest suburb. Um, a combined military, industrial, and, com- and commuter town. Uh, Marietta is, is a city that's know, that knows its food. I, I have almost no comment in that regard because I don't understand... Um, but uh, I was almost going to write this off, but it does say uh, one of the reasons is because of Alton Brown being from here. Um, Alton uh, Brown, you know, is a big is a big name. Um, in which case, uh, he's got a lot of uh, different locations. Another some of his favorite sandwiches that he's uh, partaking in are are in that location as well. So, okay, you kind you kind of came in with the with the surprise. Uh, you know, twist there with the Alton Brown, Alton Brown drop. Um, yeah. As far as uh, Berkeley, California, or Cali in general being on this list, it can't be trusted. I, I'm not going to. No. I'm not going to trust California sandwiches in any way, t- shape, or form with the amount of hipsters out there. And then, like, the amount of disappointment I've had in Cali from people recommending me any kind of sandwich or other experience out there and it being. The hottest of ass. I I just cannot rightfully put California anywhere on this list unless it's a location that has a large uh, Latino back Hispanic background where the actual fire is because that has been the only situation in which I have seen Cali not disappoint. Yeah, like, I mean, and I think uh, you know, too sushi and shit like that is probably pretty good in Cali, but. You know, I've actually had better food experiences in NorCal just due to, like, how grounded some of the areas are and, like, the soul food, you know, amongst the black people close to Oakland than I've oh, yeah, had. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They're definitely, they're definitely yeah, that, yeah, that's, good spots in Oakland, and stuff, you know, but... Bro. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, like, you know, actual, like, cal, like SoCal and shit, you know, they... No. Like, I don't take anybody's food opinion that serious out there. Like, dude, I don't want to eat avocado toast and, you know, acai bowls all damn day. I'm trying to eat some real food now. The amount of Florida stops here is actually pretty, pretty jarring too. And I was just in Miami, and Miami ain't a sandwich place. I don't know what the fuck this list is talking about. <laughs> I just don't know, bro. They said Cuban you know, sandwiches. I'm about to say Cuban. The Cuban spots are the Cuban sandwich is a banger. If you can get like a legit, authentic Cuban, like you know that is that that's some good stuff. Especially if there's like some quality marinated pork. Miami might be the only one on this list where. I can see there just for a specific type of sandwich where it, w- it would be legit. I don't know about other yeah. stuff, but the Cuban side, you get a good Cuban, like with like some fresh bread. That is indeed a banger. I got, I got to say. Right. But you're rest, right. You're right. Maybe I was too, maybe I was too harsh. I feel like Thanos right now. Maybe I'll treat them too poorly. <laughs> this man, this, <laughs> you know, I got I to do, I got to do sound effect for that. <laughs> Cause I just, added, you really, you know, you just, the FTR match. I saw accusations. The These are not accusations. This is false accusations. And look, look, your boy Rick Ross was on AEW the other day, and it was hilarious. All right, it just, but yes, you know, Rick coming, you know, your boy Rod coming in here with the accusations from from Miami. But 
there's a lot more Florida on this list still. So, I mean, you got plenty of opportunity to still slander them. Because outside of Miami, you got Pensacola, which, I mean, the very tippy top of, of uh, Florida here, it looks like. Um, population of 53,678. All right, so my man's that wrote this is actually from PA. And also, I need this man to actually, like, hit the Midwest, too. He's from PA, which means he's on the East. But besides, like, the two California locations, everything is East Coast. And, look, I get it, okay? Like, it's expensive to fly to the Midwest. Sometimes you got a little podunk or little junction airports. But there's a lot of hidden gems out here. And I just can't take – as somebody who's been to the most boring cities and had awesome meals and the biggest cities like L.A., like you're talking about, that had – I mean, they might as well be serving cooked doo-doo. Uh, I just don't know if I can take this list serious. San Francisco does have awesome food options, but – Number one, bro, like, I'm talking over Chicago, over parts of New Jersey, New York, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's a tough sell for me. I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about San Fran, but I'm, I'm looking at Delaware being on this list as high as it is, because there's, there's definitely a certain type of person that's going to Delaware to eat some sandwiches, and it's not going to be me. So, <laughs> you know, the... The fact that it's gone this high on this list is a, is a very a bit a bit questionable. Obviously, there's delis being a thing. Uh, you know, Jersey I could see being here because they've got you know the hoagies and such. I get that, mm. but yeah, Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware, and Sarasota, Florida. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, gonna have no. to question a couple of these on on that end. I mean, you're 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 assuming that people want either crab or some related version of crab or fish that for it to be on this list. Which I mean, um, it also says that this city has one deli for every 400 residents out of a population of 55,000 people. What the so fuck? That is a lot of sandwiches. Um, and uh, the Tampa Bay region is a hotbed for Florida's cherished Cuban sandwich. So theirs has salami, whereas Miami's does not. I'm not a big salami fan, so that does nothing for me um, on that end. Uh, but I do respect the Cuban as a whole. Respect it enough to be number two on the list? I don't know. Yeah, I just... I've just been to Florida so many times now. Maybe I'm not going to the right parts. I can't imagine, like, <laughs> anybody pulling up to, like, Orlando for a good meal. You know, just, you yeah, know. Yeah, this is or more like your Tampa Bay area and stuff, you know. Yeah, I get it. But, Miami, like, I just. I know, because so I know of who's cooking the stuff in Miami. And this is very at the tippy bottom. You're going to get some solid mm. seafood mixes in there with, like, the mixture of, like, Caribbean there's some good, it's a good opportunity for some sandwiches there. But like the mm-hmm. other Florida spots, I'm not going to take those seriously right now. Um, I respect Jersey being on the list somewhere because there's there's some some pretty famous hoagie spots out there. Um, but Delaware, Albany, these just look very mixture of suburban and clean. Where these are either outside of like a major university or some spots that I'm not spending much time at. You know, someone, no. someone, someone was having some, some garden state dreams with some of this list and they're not places that I'll be strolling into for a sandwich. So. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super good on that. Now I'll tell you what, all those sandwiches might vary in tastes and flavors and stuff, but there's one restaurant out there where you know exactly what you're going to get when you get it. Minus the ice cream machine working. And that is McDonald's, of course. Now, McDonald's, I just wanted to highlight this really quick. Now, of course, it's not the sauces of, of the talks. It's not super duper food related, but it's something that I think kind of combines both ends of our show in the beginning and the end. McDonald's is giving away a gaming chair packed with fast food features. Are you loving it? Now, honestly, I haven't loved McDonald's since I was a kid, but if you give me a free chair, we might be able to talk. Food and gaming have gone together since before video games. People have, people may have board game nights where food is served, and it is no different than video games. Fact, food is ingrained in gaming culture that people can order with or order food within their favorite games. It's even possible for people to order food for their favorite streamers. Of course, however, you get your own food. Where will you sit? McDonald's has the answer. The gaming chair. Now, I think this is actually a really cool thing. It, I was wondering when McDonald's is actually going to make this sort of push over into esports. 
Um, I mean, we've seen Taco Bell do. We've covered that a few times. I want to say Burger King may have done a little something, but McDonald's and eSports, hey, I'm kind of worried about KFC the future gaming. of the gamer. Hey, you know, McDonald's could be making some moves. You know, we, we saw KFC Gaming do a thing, you know. It's true. Um, I personally, like, the tie-in is cool, but me personally, I'm actually kind of tired of the push for gaming chairs because oh. gaming chairs themselves are not comfortable. I, I feel like people just acknowledge gaming chairs being the thing because they're gaming chairs. But after having several gaming chairs, I can tell you that sitting in them for long periods of time do not actually make you feel pretty good by the end. They've got more stability on the backside, you know, and you got that back support. But if you take that money and you spend it on an office chair, a good office chair with some ergonomics, Ooh. you're going to feel a lot better spending those hours playing God of War this, this week. That's uh, true. You know, so while McDonald's is putting in that, putting in the moves, I would like to see more branding that involves some ergonomic chairs. I think if, if one of these companies moves into that kind of space and tells me, hey, we got top of the line ergonomic, you know, seating for you to be able to do both your your stream content, your gaming content, and feel good while doing it. And we got plenty of uh, support for folks who may be a bit wider in the waist and aren't fitting mm. inside of, you know, your normal gaming chair. Um, but can definitely make it happen in an office chair. Hey, they would be selling like hotcakes out here. Or like some... Uh, some big riddles. True. McDonald's True. Makes I'm glad you brought that shifts. up. Yeah. I'm I'm definitely glad you brought that up, bro. Because, like, I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels that way about gaming chairs. Like, I'll sit, you know, just we're talking about commentary a little bit earlier, but this is another thing, too. Endurance. You know, endurance comes from, you know, how comfortable, how uncomfortable you are. There have been blocks where I'm just like, damn, I've been up for at least an hour and a half right now. It's like top 24, moving into top eight. I'm sitting in this uncomfortable ass DX racer. I've even gotten to the points where I've had to like stand up. Bro. I've had to like just stand up out of my seat while the camera's not on me, commentate, and then sit back down because the chairs are so uncomfortable. And one time at a tournament, you know how like the the little arm breasts they spin in and out, right? Mm. One time, one of them was broke and my finger got caught in it, Oof. and it like, bro, listen, it ripped like so much meat out of my finger, bro. You would have thought you could have seen. Oh, bro, I don't even know how I did this. And I'm, like, commentating like this the whole time because like, I basically can't show finger bleeding. Yeah, so I'm just like, yo, what's like, up? Just came in there. Yeah, you were you were going through it. Was, see, see there's, there's, there's dangerous hazards to some of this stuff, you know? And you got, like, you know, the, the chair itself is, be, is being called the McCrispy after the new uk british sandwich apparently that's happening i don't know what's in it but crispy or what makes it makes it different than the chicken but apparently that the crispy is a thing and the chair is being named after that i you know i do want to point out that there's like i don't know what's going on with these like pads on the side mm. there's like your regular arms and then there's like padding i guess to enjoy your mccrispy on but that is uh that's definitely some some intuitive engineering there it looks like you got some like shoulder pad. It looks like the kind of straps that they have when they got you like you know in weird positions, uh, you know, in the hospital. But I'm gonna just leave that there. You know, McDonald's. Maybe you onto something. Maybe you should just take some time to look into the you ergonomic know, options for your customers moving forward. Uh, that's but, true. You know, but some of it, this is you know the branding isn't bad. You know, I just when I see this chair. I, I I don't think McCrispy, based off of the name you're calling it right now, it's not it's not. No, I think crispy, I think but... Mick, I I think McFunky. I think this chair about to start stinking. <laughs> it's just like you know, I'm just I just this is one of those things where like esports. It's just like a company sees what gaming is. Like they got like yo, you still check this out in the boardroom meeting. Yo, gaming is cool, bro. Remember that gaming thing we used to do? We should have like the sixty four in the lobby. And, and then oh, it's like yeah, hell man. Hell no. Yeah, I know. We're not. Yep. We're not doing. We're not. Look, look, yep. look, think about these collaborations, guys. All right, just just consider more than you gotta, you gotta get a rise above the McCrispy. That's, that's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Gotta, gotta get a little bit deeper in the branding. But we have we have run out of time here. It's time, it's time to slide through for the last 
uh, segment of the day to talk a little bit about Cortex because, uh, of course, it has been another, another week here at Shaq News and someone's got to win the Shaq News Cortex and get those points uh, for the week for winning Shaq News. Um, you know, both the day and the week, etc. It's been there's been plenty of W's happening. Um, let's go take a look at the, the, the carnage reports to see who's been pulling it out. I know I've been using some Shaq pets the past couple weeks. You know, during my downtime on vacay and such, you know, getting some good picks in of my pup. But you can always uh, get in a few yourself with Shaq pets. You know, free plug here. If you're not using the app, you should. There's plenty of opportunity to still get in. Um, we have a fresh, a fresh, brand new week here, so it's a good opportunity for you to even maybe see your own fur baby as the pet of the week as well on Shack Pets moving forward. Um, so it should be right. good stuff. But yeah, you know, Rod, what do you what do you think about our winners here? Eight Mikey is still coming through on a big, a big one. Um, you know, pulling both in the W's. Are we really surprised? Yeah, I mean. Hey, Mikey, you know, I think every so often we go through a, a era of like somebody's super like dominant run. Right now we're in the era of A. Mikey, though he has been dethroned once since his run. Then, of course, there was a Mel Mad Dog Del 597. Not surprised at how well he's done here. Um, of course, you know, on this list as well, we have Patty Ann, we have a very own TJ Denzer, Johnny Tugs, um, Ninjace, the man with the briefcase himself. That's right, the man with the plan at command, Mr. Asif Khan. And a handful of other phenomenal individuals from our team, but A. Mike is just this, he's just too powerful, man. And honestly, Asif is a lot nicer than me. I'm going to nerf his <laughs> ass. Like, I'm going to figure out a way. I'm going I'm to tweak it. Like, A. Mikey, this can't go on forever. He can't remain incognito forever, right? We got to figure out how, a, a way to get him on the show if we're, if we're lucky. You know? And another one. And another one. Another and W for another A, Mikey. One. You know, I have to give you a, a personal <laughs> congrats because, you know, you won my birthday week, okay? October 30th was my birthday. Oh. And, and, and A, Mikey came through with the W in both Cortex and Shaq Pets this week. I mean, you know, you, you did it big. And for that, A to Mikey, you have won Shaq News for the last week. Embrace it. Enjoy it to the best of your ability. I hope that you have a good time. But, hey, we have reached the end of the show. Salute to everyone who uh, stuck around and enjoyed the eSports news. We'll be back again with the, uh, the best moments of electronic sports around the world. Um, and remember to use Shaq Pants. Check out the site. Yes. We have plenty of awesome uh, news and content as well there for you. But yeah, Rod, we got anything to say before we head out? Listen, man, if you're not using Shaq Pets, I don't know what to tell you. You must be on another app, Whack Pets or something else, man. You got to use Shaq Pets. It's the ultimate battle for cuteness. Fellas out there, this is the ultimate way for you to try to figure out a way to pitch a pickup line or something. Like, hey, look, I got this cute pet. I've been watching you at the dog park. You got a cute pet. You know what I'm saying? Let's link up on Shaq Pets and battle. Boom, simple. All right, Rod and Denny got you covered. We might even be called Hitch, you know, depending on how you want to spin it. <laughs> Um, also, you know, hit us up on social media. That's all done by the wonderful Denny Von Doom here, our co-host, Wide World. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, you're already here, Facebook, you know, whatever it is. If Shaq News Skin exists there, we're probably on there doing our thing. So pull up on us, interact with us, talk to us. We talk back. Um, of course, you can follow myself on Twitter at Ronnie Conyers Jr. You can follow Denny at Denny Von Doom, spelled exactly how you think it sounds. And, um, yeah, pull up on us, man. Until next time. As always, be easy, and we'll see you again next week. Have a good one.